Yeah, I think it's fine to let people in. Unless mm -hmm. Jennifer, Jennifer has another. Yeah. Oh, sure. I was just going to ask during the, um, for the people who are now on this side, do we um, turn our screens off when we're not going to be part of the presentation so that we're not, um, I'm seeing Susan nodding. Um, I would say leave your cameras on so that people can yeah. kind of flow through, um, you know, and see who's there if you're comfortable with that. Um, we'll be we'll be spotlighting the folks who are actually speaking, so that'll kind of pull it forefront to you know to everybody's screens. Um, but people will still be able to kind of scroll through, um, you know, the gallery to see who's there. People, right? Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Okay, awesome. Um, well, we, myself, um, Jason and Olivia are all here in the chat if you need us during, um, during. And with that, we will start letting everybody in. Carla, do you want me to disable the waiting room? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that, Olivia. Yes, please. Sorry. I... It's okay. I, I did it. Should I get started now? Sure. Yeah. Okay, welcome everyone um, to the second day of Writing for Living, the Helene Moblin Conference in Feminism and the Humanities. My name is Carla Frichero and I'll be the moderator for this morning's panel. I came to UCSE in 1991 in Literature and Feminist Studies 
and worked alongside Helene for many years, making interesting intellectual and feminist things happen. First, a land acknowledgement. UC Santa Cruz is located on the unceded territory of the Awaswas speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. Some thank yous to the sponsors, the UCSC Humanities Division and the Puknot Endowment, to Amy Brunoj and Blanca Rodriguez in Humanities who helped organize, and thanks to those who helped set up the Helene Moglen Endowment Fund, um, about which you'll see more in the chat. To the conference co-organizers and participant presenters, and to the folks who are providing critical technical assistance, Diana, Olivia, and Jason. Finally, thanks to all of you, former and current colleagues, friends, students, and visitors for being here. Before I introduce this morning's keynote speaker, I'd like to go over some technical details about today's event, which will be different in format from yesterday's amazing program honoring Helene. The conference is being recorded and archived, so it'll be available at a future time. Zoom has auto transcription or live transcript, you'll see it at the bottom of your screen, for those who'd like to read along. Um, click that box and um, it, it, pick live subtitles. Um, and um, just an additional thing, unless you are asking a question or presenting, please mute yourselves. Any background noise is really loud. Um, you may wish to choose speaker view in the up, upper right hand corner of your screen when the panelists are presenting. And if you want to participate in the Q&A um, and your name is Blanca Rodriguez, please change it to your correct name. Here's how the panels will work. I'll introduce the keynote speaker, Leslie Bowe, and then we'll run a pre-recorded video of the talk. Um, and that'll be about 33 minutes, after which I'll introduce the discussants who will speak live for eight to 10 minutes. After they speak, I'll ask Leslie, Chris, and Amy whether they have questions or comments for each other. And after that, we'll open up the questions to everyone. q and I'll be monitoring the Q&A. If you have a question, please use the raise hand function. In the new Zoom, the function is in the reactions button on the lower right hand side of your screen. When you're called on, please lower your hand. Please remember to unmute yourself to speak. <laughs> if you're having technical difficulties, please use the chat or you can send a direct message to the technical assistants, Olivia Curell and Jason Kernan. And they're also co-hosts of this event. Please keep your questions brief and to the point so that others have time to speak. It's my great pleasure now to welcome Professor Leslie Bo back to UCSC. Professor Bo is fourth generation Chinese American and year of the tiger, cat person from the Bay Area, the once low rent town of Pinole. She earned her PhD in the Board of Studies in Literature in 1993, working with Akasha Hull and Jose Saldivar and Helene Moglen. Her work there became the book Betrayal and Other Acts of Subversion, Feminism sexual politics, Asian American women's literature. She's also the author of the award-winning book on comparative racialization, Partly Colored, Asian Americans and Racial Anomaly in the Segregated South, an editor of Asian American Feminisms. This is her first time back, to use those funny air quotes, to Santa Cruz in 23 years. She's joining us from the frozen tundra of the Midwest, where she's Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor of English and Asian American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Leslie is a positive poster 
is the Wisconsinite only by her driver's license, but is reconsidering that as the state continues in a positive post-election path. She once purchased a giant foam cheese hat, which between kids and dogs lasted a grand total of one day in the house. And she never once made hot dish with tater tots and curds. Her talk today, Racist Love, comes from her forthcoming book with Duke University Press titled Racist Love, Asian Americans and the Pleasures of Fantasy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Leslie Bull. Hi everyone and happy Lunar New Year. It's been a while since we've been back at UCSC. Now 28 years later, um, coming back to what I was learning with Helene that many years ago in the 80s um, in feminist theory. And the positive thing about coming from a family of hoarders is that nothing's ever lost. And I just wanted to share with you this copy of the cover of Helene Moglen's feminist a theory course, History of Consciousness in 1988. And of course, a lot of the things that I'm gonna be talking with uh, you about today, um, deriving from feminist psychoanalytic theory actually come from a lot of the things that Helene was teaching at that time about individuation and attachment. And of course, the topic I'm doing today is how we take pleasure from racial difference. Um, incidentally, uh, it was the copy center that put this image on Helene's uh, reader. And of course, she was properly horrified about that. But today, I wanted to explore attraction as the very form of anti-Asian bias, the overt and subtle ways in which social hierarchy becomes reinforced by positive feeling or racial scopophilia animated by other forms of emotional attachment, affection, empathy, or amusement. And so before I start off, a little bit of a content warning because some of you um, may have a very visceral reaction to some of the images that I'm showing, maybe negative, but also maybe positive. So we'll see. What Bell Hooks famously deemed, quote, getting a bit of the other, extends the idea of erotic encounter with difference to cultural appropriation or theft, yet it also speaks to the tension surrounding fetishistic love, imbuing objects with desire that forestalls an underlying anxiety. In naming racist love as a structure of split feeling that attaches to Asians in the United States, I take that process of fetishistic reduction literally in order to engage the representation, not of Asian people, but of their non-human proxies. So how does our effective relationship with things speak to fantasies of racialization? My current objects of study, Asianized kitchen goods, cartoon pandas, life-size dolls, testify to the saturation and displacement of racial meaning, its ability to be abstracted from human embodiment as repositories of seemingly positive feeling and intimate connection. Imagine beings are yet conduits of political desires. If fantasy functions as a setting for desire, what desires reveal themselves in the space between coalitional based politics and racialized things animated through our regard? As racial meaning, continues to be harnessed through the circulation of negative feeling, I ask, what about love? And I'm gonna share with you my first slide that gets at this idea, which is a geisha car, a minor figure in an imaginary world populated by anthropomorphic vehicles and cars too. This image of Kuni is unmistakably Japanese relying on ethnic signs, fan, chopsticks, hairstyle, detachable from the body in order to convey human attributes. It represents a pleasurable form of abstraction, substitution that takes in um, part for the whole, 
a visual stereotype of dubious humor, the cartoon's reduction and exaggeration also invites a series of telescoping um, outward signs, geisha to Japan, technology to techno-dominance. It cites trade competition while taming it through the visual joke, through yellow face. Okuni performs the inverse of capitalist reification, not the reduction of persons to things, but the fantasy of things come to life. So does the geisha car manage to fly nowadays under the radar of hard-won covenants against caricature and racist kitsch because it exists in a fantastical world in which every car has ethnicity? Or because it evokes the sentiments that accrue to Kauai, the aesthetic of the cute that stimulates feelings of affection and care? Or does a cartoon fail to convey racial injury because it's Asian? Okay. The amazing gives pleasure, Aristotle noted. If the amazing geisha car is a suspect pleasure, then to whom? What underlies the assumption that domination is reproduced in its circulation? Igniting a range of possibilities for spectatorship, Okuni embodies a curious paradox, racialized things that convey both delight and offense, innocent fun and discriminatory action, a form of visual hate speech or microaggression. It is also somewhat adorable. And of course, that is the tension that you'll see upcoming when you're invited to click during the break, uh, mal-era exercise uh, clips. So that same kind of attention, offense, delight, which. So today I wanted to enter with you that space of discomforting racial feeling, one enabled by the processes of abstraction at first glance, the harm of projecting reductive racial meaning becomes obvious when it's applied to things like a chopstick font or a kung flu. Countering race as embodied materiality, I set out to explore the meanings underlying racial abstraction in its most mundane forms, like this cartoon animals in picture books, home decor, kitchen, kitchen tchotchkes, real or imagined robots, Yet these anthropomorphic figures are conduits for understanding complex form of attachment surrounding Asian Americans in what Sara Ahmed deems an effective economy of circulated feeling that materializes collective bodies. In exploring how raci the racial imaginary in the US is underwritten by an oscillation of feeling, I engage the ways in which the substitution uh, of things for people also becomes a means of narrating and visualizing difference at the millennium. That structure of feeling was identified at the very origins of Asian American studies as racist love, a term coined by writers Frank Jin and Jeffrey Paul Chan in 1972 on the heels of Asian American social movements. Each racial stereotype comes in two models, they wrote, the unacceptable hostile uh, Black Stud has his acceptable counterpart in the form of Stephen Fetchett. For Fu Manchu and the Yellow Peril, there's Charlie Chan and his number one son. There is racist hate and racist love. So these are merely flip sides of the same coin. Years before Homi Baba theorized the stereotype as phobia and fetish, Chin and Chan foregrounded the ways in which typing operated along a continuum of split feeling racist love as oxymoron. So rather than naming stereotypical content, I wanna highlight the ways in which Asian difference in the United States uh, incites a specific de desiring structure, one characterized by equivocation. For Asian Americans, the slur is often indistinguishable from the compliment. Cast as model minority subjects of national approval since the Cold War, they appear to confound metrics linking race and precarity. Asian Americans figure ambivalently in the US as uneasy signifiers of social justice, injustice, according to selective and disaggregated metrics of inequality. 
the Pew Research Center released a report on the state of Asian America in 1912, uh, 2012, that began, quote, Asian Americans are the highest income, best educated, and fastest growing group in the United States. And of course, that's only true when you look at disaggregated data or specific groups. So this, this thinly disguised object love, such proclamations mark racial projection as a hiding place for the national libido. The repository of displaced narcissism, Asians have what we lack. Yet the highest, the best, the fastest calls forth an underlying dread. The label model minority is quintessential racist love, vacillating between the philic and the phobic. As model minority and yellow peril book in continuums of racial feeling, their differing valences obscure the identical processes, um, uh, identical processes, assigning a fixity of type that incites emotional response. So expressed attraction encodes the same structure as anti-Asian bias. And Franz Fanon thus famously declared once, quote, the man who adores the Negro is as sick as the man who abominates him. The sickness of adoration disproportionately envelops public discourse surrounding Asians in the US, revealing itself in freely shared declarations about loving Oriental food, culture, or women. Yellow fever is not a confession of secret desire, but uncensored proclamation. Asiaphilia surrounding things was enabled by the deliberate absence of Asian people due to exclusionary immigration laws. Quote, the notion of Chineseness under the sign of the exotic, writes James Moy, became familiar to the American spectator long before sightings of actual Chinese. And numerous scholars have named the Orient as detachable aesthetic. What uh, Jane Park deemed Oriental style, Sunai Namara, Indo chic, and Cheng or ornamentalism, and Josephine Lee, decorative Orientalism, reinforced the idea of Asia as surface. And I think this is why Asianness in the United States is so easily abstracted and typed, mischaracterized as inaccurate content. The stereotype scripts racial difference into a narrow range of narratives and visual triggers whose pleasures lie in part in their repetition. The stereotype, Baba writes, vacillates between what is already in place, always known, and something that must be anxiously repeated. The same stories must be told compulsively again and afresh and are differently gratifying and terrorizing at the same time. And so what we see today, as in the past, with the typhoid epidemic was a similarly pro similar process of telescoping. You know, so it spread by overpopulation and lack of sanitation, but that then shifted to Chinatown as a region and then to unsanitary Chinese practices and then to Chinese people. So this very idea of exaggeration and reduction, people to disease is what we saw in the past and also today. Yet racist love is also rooted in reductive structures of typing, something it shares with racial profiling. Both take pleasure in the same old, same old. In the non-human turn in academic scholarship, heralded by our own Donna Haraway, contemporary work on animals, uh, the environment, the biome, networks, technology, or tools, invoke a reconsideration of what constitutes the human, decentering the hubris of anthropocentrism. In contrast to the school of post-Kantian thought that loosely travels as the new materialism, speculative realism, or OOO, affirming the irreducible alterity of the non-human, my own non-human turn takes a pivot towards a potentially uh, uh, unconventional source. So you may recognize here decluttering guru Marie Kondo 
and here she's doing her spark joy gesture. And her philosophy is that you should only keep your possessions that spark joy for you. And I'm kind of obsessed with that idea, as I said, coming from a family of hoarders. But Kondo's Shinto-derived philosophy affirms the effective impact of possessions or of things. In asserting reciprocity between the human and the inanimate, Kondo inadvertently expresses a radical imperialism, I'm, I'm sorry, empiricism, fundamentally questioning anthropocentrism. Her home tidying disciples are essentially asked to assume the same humble viewpoint of ethical posthumanism. Pushing Kondo's spark joy movement and the new materialism into dialogue, I ask, can racial things spark joy? For whom? Are they also a source of injury, of wounding? Can they be both at once? So rather than affirm the tiny ontology of things or our ethical relationship to non the non-human, I want to consider how things make a difference in a network of human relationality. Objects ventriloquize us, declares Bill Brown, and I would add that they ventriloquize us when they become imbued with feeling, generate attachment, or incite possession, or more specifically here, split feeling, ambivalent attachment, and possessiveness. So here's a case in point. I want to tell you a story about what you see in front of you. This is a juicer made by Alessi, the Italian purveyor of upscale home goods. And it's titled Mandarin Citrus Squeezer. And what you do is you take the hat off it, which is canonical, uh, conical, and then you just make, squeeze your uh, juice into the uh, top and you pour it into the head, which is a cup to drink. And I found it in San Francisco in 2006. And when I first saw it, I thought, wow, that's appalling. That form of Asianized abstraction and caricature in this day and age, it seemed to be marketed with no awareness of the idea of racist kitsch. Um, I bought it because I thought it embodied a kind of teachable moment, but I also bought it for a second reason. I thought it was adorable. I thought it was cute. And of course, that aesthetic style, Kwai, um, is designed to actually elicit those exact feelings of pleasure, but also domination. And if we were together in Santa Cruz, I would have shown you more of these images and done a fun, but also potentially triggering a problematic exercise when you yourselves would give me your interpretation of things like these. But my attachment to cute racist juicers like these is certainly a guilty pleasure. Does that compromise my membership in a community defined by a clear-cut stance towards anti-racism? Can I racist love a uni or this juicer, the Mandarin? Eve Oshi has called this perverse spectatorship. And artist Kara Walker likewise situates the figure of something like Scarlett O'Hara in her work as a source of her own perverse spectatorship wanting to be both the white heroine and kill her at the same time. And of course, her work is bound up with the, the idea of pleasurable first plantation. I want to name racist love as a structure of feeling that attaches to Asians as a form of racial management. But I also want to think of it in terms of a complex means of self affirmation. And of course, that's the first complication of racial spectatorship. And here's the second that suggested um, by a story told to me by a white academic American man about how he met his Chinese wife. So he told me the story about he how he traveled to the People's Republic of China and had the fortune to attend a concert where his future wife was playing in the orchestra. Um, and he could only see the back of her head as she played the violin. But he related to me that, in fact, he fell in love with the back of her head. And from his perspective, that was incurably romantic. From my perspective, it was pretty kinky. 
you know, the force of the Orient was all he needed, like David Henry Wong's uh, in Butterfly, to imagine the perfect woman. It is a racist love story that suggests how the reduction to type both operates as fetishistic pleasure and also masquerades as racial knowledge. Yet whether understood as object substitution or as sexual objectification, race fetishism is an expression of power and an indication of its instability. How do Asian Americans imaginatively counter this excessive object love? And then the first part of it, when I talk with this about my students, it's always about asserting the fullness of personhood that is the counter to race fetishism. Um, and here's the, the alternative way. So this is Hong Chung Zhang's triptych, Three Graces, and you saw the detail um, prior to this point. Um, this work both embraces and counters the idea of fetishistic reduction. It's a portrait of her and her two sisters, depicting them as almost otherworldly creatures made entirely of hair. And of course, I don't know that if she knows cousin it um, from the Adams family, but that's what it reminds me of. These uh, skull, uh, scrolls are about eight feet tall, so it's larger than life beautiful, but also slightly monstrous. In fetishistic substitution, the woman becomes a single sensuous body part, hair, rendering all women identical and alike. Um, and yet Zhang's drawings call forth an alternative racial meaning, withholding the face the artist literally uh, turns her back on the conventions of Western portraiture. She denies figures their individuality and shout out to the work of Jennifer Gonzalez here as well. But the artist also denies fetishizing liberal selfhood located in individuality and autonomy. The drawings affirm the absolute unity of the sisters and their appearance as a single undifferentiated collective based on resemblance. And it's a kind of faceless solidarity that I'm seeing here that really does remind me of Yoko Ono's um, 1966 avant-gardist work, Bottoms, which was a great idea, not necessarily great to watch, but it's a sequence of 365 naked human butts shot in loving close-up for about 15 seconds each. And admittedly, a boring film, but Conceptually, it actually affirms that whatever our differences, quote, underneath, we are all alike. As Asian American and Asian American artist, Zhang takes on quintessential manifestations of racist love, reduction to body part, and like these strands of hair, twists it. And the rest of her work really is about the, that tension between beauty and repulsion. Um, she draws a lot of uh, food as hair, for example. So Robert Stoller once surmised that the fetish is a story masquerading as an object. And I want to investigate not the stories underlying fetishistic desire, but those underlying attempts to reconcile that desire to reparative projects of racial community building and social justice, Asian American political desire. Talking back, to race fetishism produces oppositional pleasures that dovetail with the split desires of erotic fantasy. The very act of making reductive typing, uh, marking reductive typing as beyond the pale may succeed in creating not only racial consciousness or wokeness, but libidinally charged racial taboos. Scholarly and pedagogical practices surrounding race fetishism may well reflect the structural ambivalence intrinsic to fetishism itself, my own um, practices included. So when I get a little bit meta here to talk about how structures of racial desire might apply to my own um, identifications as an academic. So I became kind of obsessed with this sculpture by Canadian visual artist, Alicia Lim called uh, Drag McQueen. Um, and it's two wedge boots fashioned from cake. 
And that sculpture really calls upon shoe fetishism while suggesting something more. And the I scene actually reads shoes. Oh my God, these shoes rule. Let's get some vetch. And it's a clever rift on comedian Liam uh, Kyle Sullivan's campy video shoes that satirizes an overinvestment in footwear. Now, Lim's work highlights commodity fetishism and the displaced libidinal energy that it both announces and screens same sex desire. Let's get some is presumably addressed to a woman, but invokes shopping through a masculine sexual idiom. The a gentle top presumes a feminized bottom being someone's bitch. Uh, the icing can be misread, let's get some butch, a slippage that might also reflect Lim's 2010 book, A Hundred Butches, consisting of sketches of random women who represent her crushes. And that piece plays upon multiple forms of substitution, invoking objects and the processes of fulfilling desire uh, through them from cake to shoe to woman, from eating to shopping to sex. And this is Lim creating those sculptures. Now, to find out more about the work she had done, I tracked her down and asked them what happened to the cake. Unfortunately, I put my email query thusly. I have to ask, did you save it or did you throw it out? Better yet, did you eat it? Lynn's email response was telling. They replied, uh, are you Asian? I'm wondering if you're coming to a place of being subject to the fetish or indulging the fetish. I'm sorry if this question seems rude. I just want to make sure that I understand everything. And of course, I was mortified. The artist thought they were being catfished by the creepy stalker, which I then came to realize that I was. I loved the cake shoe and of course cake and shoes. Um, for me, the piece multiplied sites of queer spectatorship at the intersection. And my overinvestment in this object of study uh, mirrored the fetishist overinvestment in his object substitutes. I endowed the cake shoe with symbolic importance that legitimizes and confirms my own identity, which for better or worse, is inseparable from my academic identity. And I would most certainly eat, make, buy, Instagram that cake. The artist's query, are you Asian, implies that if I were, I could not then occupy a, a position of scopophilic mastery over Asian women. Incidentally, the cake is varnished so you cannot eat it. Um, and that overlap, let's say here, that overlap between fetishistic indulgence, I'm just going for it here, and academic critique also becomes evident in this 2013 online feature in New York Magazine entitled Nine Sexy College Classes, Classes Happening This Fall. Um, the article highlights this undergraduate course that you can see depicted in the slide in Asian American Studies at MIT, and it reads, Images of Asian Women, Dragon Ladies and Lotus Blossoms. Through debates about Orientalism, gender and power, MIT students will work out the quote, circumstances that create and perpetuate the stereotypes of Asian women. Dragon ladies, lotus blossoms, despotic tyrants, desexualized servants and docile subordinates, unquote. Also, probably meet a lot of Asian women. So, ha ha. The idea of the race fetishists showing up and countering a lot of Asian American feminists is actually kind of funny. But what the feature also inadvertently illuminates is the way in which stereotype analysis heralds in our own Wendy Brown's terms, the wounded attachment of coalitional identity. The article's humor does not succeed in overriding uh, the conceit that the presence of Asian women make a course uh, sexy, something that that image that you're seeing here that came with it um, reinforces. 
Nevertheless, humor here forces a parallel between the occasion for critiquing yellow fever for one audience and for another, the occasion for partaking in it. Both engage similar desires of um, structures of desire. For the former, the process of self-creation out of differentiation, I'm not that image, nevertheless mirrors that of those who might show up looking for, in a more creepy way maybe, an externalized repository for their narcissism. I love myself, Eurasian women. So, turn the screen. So I don't mean to imply that the activist enterprise here represents a kind of pathology because courses like this one at MIT validate the productive nature of fantasy. Yet the very act of marking stereotyping as a form of injurious misrecognition may succeed in creating not only racial consciousness, but erotically charged racial taboos. Um, and by that, I mean also around the idea of the ethnic joke. So I am the butt of that article's joke in a way, but I also find it funny. And that's something that we can certainly discuss in Q&A. But for now, I'd point to one intent of my own course that is like that one. We create ourselves through disidentification with the reviled object, or to put it another way, as a het cisgendered Asian American woman, I do indeed love myself through Asian women. And I think uh, there I'm really confronting the deep structure of my own creepiness and overinvestment in ways that I think Helene would absolutely appreciate and that she would actually find herself really funny. So let me conclude by citing bell hooks again. She wrote that difference can seduce precisely because the mainstream imposition of sameness is a provocation that terrorizes. Neoliberal globalization's increasing urbanization, industrialization, bureaucracy, and secularization project a future world that terrorizes in its sameness. Racist love calls up the erotic charge of seductive difference that responds to US fears of both homogeneity and an Asianized future. As in the past, Racist love looks outwards to Asia for its bit of the other, for the object that makes satisfaction possible while imperfectly concealing racial anxiety. During COVID, the gloves of racist hate came off, um, as we saw most recently in the Bay Area and in New York City, as the same old stories about Asians and public health in the 21st century became resurrected. For good reason then, Asian American Studies addresses the effects of hatred and xenophobia, exclusion, scapegoating, discrimination, inequality, and violence through objects of study that derive their political force through the realist representation of trauma, something a little bit different um, from what I've shown you today. So following Helene's model, I want to illuminate the desiring structures surrounding race that exceed its public projection is a conscious problem of competing constituencies. In suggesting Asian racialization as it operates through, in part, fetishistic projection, connecting caricature, interracial attraction, and also perhaps counterintuitively racial profiling, I hope to uncover latent racial feeling and explore how it circulates through abstraction as things circulate narratives of injury without human subjects. As fantasy of the, of the non-human echo tropes of difference and oppression, colonization and resistance, the wounded subjects of racial grievance are both oddly present and conveniently underground, appearing to evade prohibitions placed on race in the 21st century. As cartoon cars, juicers, and women's hair circulate racial meaning, they represent ideologically invested templates for racial coping and rendering Asian American and render Asian Americans simultaneously everywhere. And once again, nowhere. So that's it. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you in real time in a little bit. Bye. Thank you so much, um, Leslie.
Next, I'd like to introduce our two discussants um, who are also going to speak in the order um, that they're introduced. Chris Chen is an associate professor of literature at UC Santa Cruz. He's published poetry, essays, interviews, and reviews in Boundary 2, the South Atlantic Quarterly, the Rutledge Companion to Literature and Economics, The New Inquiry, Crayon, 1913, A Journal of Forms, Tripwire, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. His book-length comparative study of contemporary Black and Asian North American experimental poetry, Literature and Race in the Democracy of Goods, is forthcoming from Bloomsbury. Amy Mihang Ginther is an award-winning queer, transracially adopted professor, theater maker, and activist at UCSC. Her practice as research examines the intersection of the body, voice, identity, and power through anti-racist decolonial pedagogy, often in conversation with adoption studies and sociolinguistics. Her edited volume on this topic will be published next year with Routledge. Her last show, Homeful, has had premieres off-Broadway in San Francisco and London and was a keynote presentation for the American Adoption Congress Conference. Professor Ginther is currently developing a musical about contestants of color who have been eliminated from The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, titled No Danger of Winning. Her current pandemic delight is to buy boxes of fancy chocolates and eat one piece a day like an ongoing advent calendar to nowhere and never. Chris? That's actually a pretty good practice. I think I might take that up myself, um, a chocolate per day on the way to nowhere. Um, well, thank you for the um, organizers of this conference for allowing me to just say a few things. And um, I, I'm not gonna use my full time, but I wanted to, to just kind of linger over some moments in this presentation. And you know, having had the chance to to both read and listen to it, the, um, I think it's um, I was really reminded of Barbara Johnson's *Persons and Things*, uh, a collection of essays on what the critic calls the thingliness of persons and the personhood of things. And in that book, uh, Johnson reminds her readers that quote, although often hotly denied, people's relations with things or uh, uh, contain or embody the hopes and fears they think belong to their relations with people. Um, and I think in, in this really great presentation, uh, the turn to racial objects really offers a fascinating opportunity to return to and rethink the forms of stereotype analysis uh, that informed an earlier political history of the emergence of Asian American studies in Asian America as a kind of political formation. Um, so what a generation of 1960s and 70 er 70s era cultural nationalists like Frank Chin and Jeffrey Chan identified as the ambivalent uh, or split character of anti-Asian racism that turns on both racist hate and racist love. And I love how the presentation highlights the effective valences of Asian racialization uh, as inciting, quote, a specific desiring structure, one characterized by equivocation. Uh, for Asian Americans, Leslie argues, the slur is often indistinguishable from the compliment. For a population that has simultaneously been viciously scapegoated but also, quote, cast as subjects of national approval since the Cold War. So the subsequent exploration of a kind of grammar of objects as an entry point uh, for rethinking the fetish character of Asian typing or stereotyping, I think opens up a lot of really fresh possibilities uh, for reading together a range of seemingly uh, disparate examples of Asian representation in contemporary US mass media, you know, from Pixar's anthropomorphized and ethnicized cars uh, to the church of Marie Kondo. Uh, and I'll have a little bit more to say about Marie Kondo because I think her reception is really fascinating. Um, so if, quote, a fetish is a story masquerading as an object, the paper's analysis of racial objects and what we, we can do, we can and do do to them and with them presents, I think, a series of opportunities to retell the history of Asian America differently. Um, there's a really rich and disturbing backstory here about uh, the vitriolic reception of Marie Kondo in the United States. And, you know, of course, Kondo is one of the examples that, um, that Leslie was talking about, you know, where the Kondo method is, is perceived as a subtle 
insidious threat, not only to defenseless household objects in danger of being thrown away um, and to hoarders, but also I think to the expansive claims of what Cheryl Harris famously dubbed whiteness as property. Um, you know, and the, the, the kind of like, you know, a deep resentment and hatred that Kondo I think is, you know, sort of elicits among some of uh, the audience, her audience, her audiences is, is just extraordinary. Um, so I'm especially interested in how Leslie theorizes uh, kind of near the end of this presentation, the impact of internalized objects of racist love, uh, the impact of that on the prospects of constructing an affirmative Asian American political subject. Um, so the paper is, is marked by the, uh, you know, the kind of occasional confessions of the author um, of uh, their, about their own ambivalence uh, and about uh, the ambi their ambivalent abiding scholarly attachment to racial things as both an object of inquiry, uh, but also as, quote, an ambivalent means of self-affirmation for Asian Americans, unquote. Uh, and uh, the paper ties this, uh, the sort of examples, the readings of these various objects to the vexed question of the coherence of Asian America as a political coalitional subject. So if, as Leslie argues, the fetish is a kind of potentially pleasurable means of cultural self-determination where we, quote, create ourselves through disidentification with an object that, that can become an obsession, unquote, I wonder uh, about how a language of racial objects might undo or radically recontextualize earlier discourses of group culture and racial unity uh, that people like Frank Chan and Jeffrey Paul Chan struggle to articulate and claim as a basis for Asian American political agency. Um, and this seems like an especially urgent problem, I think as the conditions of Asian racialization within the US are altered by the terms of I think a new cold war with China um, and with a pandemic where we've seen a dramatic escalation of anti-Asian violence across the US. Uh, here also, I'm also thinking about the recent violence in, in Oakland and San Francisco that's made the international news. So as Leslie points out in the paper, uh, this turn signals the return to a kind of racist hate and the potential reappearance of an older stereotype of the Asian body as a vector of disease. Uh, and here I'm curious about the impact uh, about uh, the impact of new old racial anxieties uh, on how we might read the fetish character of Asian objects. Uh, will we return to forms of representation and scholarly analysis that quote, derive their political force through the realist representation of trauma or will we go somewhere else potentially? Um, and uh, you know, the last thing I'll say is, is uh, just I wanted to kind of leave a broader question here for further discussion about how, uh, as Leslie argues, we might reimagine Asian American politics differently uh, if critical attention is shifted toward the logic of a material structure uh, where quote, racialized things circulate narratives of injury and transcendence uh, without human subjects, um, unquote. All right, so those are my, those are my really quick uh, comments. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to the next respondent. Thank you, Chris. Amy, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Carla. Uh, before I start officially, I wanna say that uh, I did not consent to becoming an uninvited settler on this unceded territory I am on, but I benefit from this status nonetheless and continue to dedicate my research and practice to being in solidarity with the original stewards of this land, the Yupi and Amamutsin tribal communities. I'm grateful for Donna Haraway, Carla Fichero, Jennifer Gonzalez, and the incredible staff for the labor you have all put into this event and for the thoughtful conference presenters yesterday and today. Uh, also, a special thank you and shout out to Leah Nichols, who will be providing some visual descriptions of this presentation in the chat. Uh, I also encourage you to use the chat. Uh, I won't be responding to it during the time, but I'm happy to respond to things at the end and during the Q&A. A few weeks ago, or maybe it was a week ago, I don't know, pandemic time, a video of a white Texas lawyer, Rod Ponton, was stuck in a Zoom filter as he tried to convince us he was indeed not a cat. Uh, and this took the internet by storm. Uh, 
Uh, I want to suggest here that the ridiculousness of a white dude as this adorable non-human other uh, comes from its rarity. And it's a contrast to the way Dr. Bo was connecting Asian Americans as non-human subjects in her paper earlier. Today, I aim to extend and further complicate some of Dr. Bo's concepts around racist love from the pan-Asian American experience to transracial Korean adopted identity. I will highlight some of the ways racist love is embodied through the hierarchies of race, class, and gender, inciting a displacement of 200,000 Korean adopted people since the Korean War uh, that continues to perpetuate trauma and marginalization within transracially adopted families. I will show some examples of artist Kate Hers Rees work where she uses objects to highlight the disappearance of the Korean adopted body and offer an intervention from my own performance practice, dramaturgy of deprivation or ukta. I wanna be clear that uh, transracial in this context does not mean sorry white women trying to pass as black or brown. In this context, it means being adopted into a family whose race differs from theirs, often black and brown folks being adopted by white folks and has been an established term in adoption studies for decades. I have a resource for this along with other citations from this response and I'll post that in the, the chat at the end of the presentation. Dr. Bo concluded her talk with this idea of Asian Americans being simultaneously everywhere and once again, nowhere. And I assert that this is even more so the case for transracial Korean adopted people who make up 10% of the Korean diaspora in the United States. Adopted scholar Kim Park Nelson writes, Asian American immigrant communities appear to be largely unaware of or unconcerned about the issue of transnational adoption, and they generally do not embrace Asian adoptees. So not only do transracial Korean adopted people experience the same constraints under the white imagination in the US, they are further rendered nowhere by the US Asian diasporas, which uh, uh, Chris Chen uh, talked about that, that coherence of our Asian American identities. So that is part of this for sure. I also wanna note that transracially adopted uh, Koreans, uh, they are, often raised by white parents. And so there is um, there are levels and elements of privilege here. So it's not just like a simple hierarchy. Um, however, their biological connections to their families are severed and they are indeed raised by often white and often racist parents. And I was struck by Dr. Bo's reference to Kara Walker wanting to be both the white heroine and kill her at the same time. For many transracially adopted people, this encapsulates the way they view and experience the whiteness of their only, some, sometimes their only known family members. Dr. Elena J. Kim has written extensively about the history and activism of Korean adoption. And she asserts that uh, in as particularly the 1970s and 80s, which is the wave of adoption after the Korean War, um, that these adopted people were products of an underfunded welfare system and Cold War developmentalist state that equated low population growth with economic progress and invested heavily in military spending to ensure national security at the expense of social programs. Adopted people were commodified in South Korea. They were a literal export. Agencies manipulated and duplicated records to make adopted people more adoptable. Sometimes babies were simply swapped out for one another when their paperwork was disregarded. I am one of the likely thousands of adopted people from Korea whose status on my paperwork was changed to uh, say orphan, which is an outright lie. My Korean mother is very much alive. Uh, and to appease uh, the US government's scant overseas adoption policies at the time. So I'm going to share two images from Dr. Kim's book. This one is a table of the um, amount of adopted people going overseas annually from 1953 to 2008. And you can see I've circled the number next to 1983, which would be nine, uh, one less if, if it wasn't for me. And I, I also wanna highlight that I wrote at the time, how do you feel, which is my way of bringing myself back to my own feeling sensing body and humanity as opposed to just being a number here. 
And this is also from Dr. Kim's uh, book. This is an ad for um, sponsoring or adopting Korean orphans in 1956 in the LA Times. Uh, the font choices is, I, I they're just horrific. Um, and also you can note this uh, coupon that you can clip out if you would like to um, send, that, send that in. So experts in, uh, estimate that in South Korea, they, South Korea made somewhere between 15 and $20 million a year at the height of Korean adoption. So using my own year 1983 and doing the math, adjusting for inflation, I have uh, calculated that my value today is about 1,315 boba teas, if you want to base that on my favorite place downtown in the mission, on the mission here in Santa Cruz. The sentimentalization of adoption, I argue, is part of Dr. Bo's idea of racist love. Um, white U.S. families are often adopting South Korean babies in ways that are consistent with her assertion that the U.S., quote, looks outward towards Asia for a bit of the other, for a, the object that makes satisfaction possible while imperfectly concealing racial anxiety. Dr. Kim argues that the model minority myths about Asian immigrants coincide with predominant views of infant girls, infant Asian girls, as most likely to be accepted in homes and communities, contrasting to older Black children in the United States coming from foster care, for example. Korean adopted people embody both racist love and racist hate. They can be both the model minority or the good, grateful adoptee or Yellow Peril, the angry, ungrateful activist adoptee. Dr. Kim writes, adoptees embody and expose the contradictions of the global. They are like holographs. Turned one way, they appear to be the most privileged of cosmopolitans. Turned the other, they are the ultimate subalterns as orphaned and abandoned children. Art is one of the many ways that adopted activists express their and explore these complex identities by reclaiming their invisibilized narratives. I recently cur curated an exhibition with the All Foundation on Korean adopted art and activisms. One of the artists, Kate Hers Ree, often focuses on objects, especially ones that are either worn or originally parts of the body to highlight the absence of the body. So this is one of her works, uh, no, There's No Place Like Korea, which invokes the search for a safe place, a home, in, similarly to how Dorothy in Wizard of Oz was able to find one within herself. And in Allegiance, Fidelity, and the Boundaries of Belonging, this video installation provides a deluge of documents necessary to both facilitate Rhee's adoption and later dual citizenship application. The paperwork only gives us, gives, gives us a whiff of material humanity through fingerprints, signatures, and tiny grayscale baby mugshot passport photos. In my own performance work, I have become less interested in using both content and form in a way to dramaturgically generate individualistic compassion and empathy for the other, as Dr. Nikki Yaboa argues that these dramatic narratives are the systems that create racialized trauma. Mm -hmm. I'm inspired by the Korean word okta, uh, or the idea that there is none, or to be lacking or non-existent. This is similar to the Spanish word faltar. Uh, instead of working to perform and prove my humanity for an audience, how can I compel them to feel irreconcilable, ambiguous loss of self histories so we can rage together and be inspired to make collective changes to the adoption industrial complex that continues to this day? So to reference back yesterday when Helene in her writing was talking about the scaffolding of self through writing, I'm interested in the in-between spaces and having audience experience that in addition to the scaffolding structure itself. Uh, I highly recommend the recent documentary by Sun Hee Engelstoff, Forget Not, which highlights how these practices of coerced and forced uh, relinquishment of children in Korea continue to this day. It was shot in 2018. 
and is heartbreaking. That's also in the links I will send you all. I'm also happy to discuss uh, examples of my own practice from um, in the in the Q and A. I conclude today by asserting that I am also not a cat. Baby cats generally are not separated from mother cats until 12 weeks after their birth in order to ensure their uh, safety and their, and their health, a relative luxury for transracially adopted people. Many of us were separated from grieving mothers the day we were born, many of whom were forced to relinquish us when they were pregnant still. Adopted writer Mary Kim Arnold reminds us, being visible is not the same as being seen. I dream of ways Korean adopted people will be seen by white folks, folks with biological privilege, and by their larger Asian American immigrant communities. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, and so right now, I'd like to ask, um, Leslie, Chris, and Amy, if you have comments for each other to get us started. Can I just start by saying, <laughs> wow, that was awesome. And, and it's complete, the filters, which I'm hoping everybody saw, that is completely going to go viral. And it's completely apropos of what we were talking about. So thank you, Amy. That is uh, That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I wanted to add that content wise, uh, when I was talking about racist love, the first chapter of the book is actually about transracial adoptees as they are portrayed as animals in children's picture books. So the idea of species difference there being a way to get at, we're all family in spite of being physically different from one another. So that was an absolutely spot on uh, connection. And I think that you are gonna go viral and <laughs> delivering your academic response as a cat, um, but also as those, again, disturbing, adorable, orientalist figures, I don't know, we, I would like to know what other people are thinking. Um, and Chris, thank you so much for pointing out the idea of the reconnection of this moment of Asian American subject formation that maybe in flux, maybe has to be re-conceptualized. Uh, and it was really that, that thread of anxiety about how can I call myself Asian American if blah, 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 you know, um, that really gets at the heart of um, the end of this talk, which is, you know, about the nature of the coherence of that subject. So thank you both. I, I, I will never forget this. It's seared in my brain. Thank you. Oh, and can I also add to connect to the wonderful presentations uh, yesterday? When I was listening yesterday, I could not help but think about how Helene's footprints were all over what I was talking about today. Um, because I don't remember in that feminist theory class talking about uh, re or reading Melanie Klein and object relations theory with Helene at the moment. It was like, you know, she had moved on to other things, more current uh, feminist work. But certainly that or origin where we are actually reading uh, Nancy Chodoro's uh, work and that idea of how you're attached to something and how you differentiate it from it as a form of uh, identification or disidentification that Seth was talking about yesterday. That is so Helene. And, and I also love the fact that I think Helene would have loved that, the visual presentation of this as well. So I'll stop. Um, I guess, you know, um, I kind of, you know, kind of read off some of my comments, but I was curious about the, the whole structure of the book. Like, as it, is it, has it been laid out? I mean, like, I'm really curious about the sort of how you organized your approach to racial objects. 
Yeah, so one of the cornerstones of this work was really to connect the uh, design structures of fetishism and caricature. And so uh, you saw the little, there were two little pieces of that, like the last one ends with how Asian Americans talk back to the notion of being fetishized through uh, especially art practices. Um, and one of the middle chapters talks about those objects, which was actually, if we were together, I was gonna do a workshop in which you told me what you think of some of these objects that are all this Japanese aesthetic called kawaii, which is reflected in the filters that you put up, Amy, you know, so that these, you know, like, is it cute or is it just really giving in to the worst impulses of caricature? And so that was a, the middle part. And of course, the first part really is about the displacement of uh, human beings, in this case, transracial adoptees from Asia being conveyed through species difference. So as animals, and so that that carried the the narrative through the organization through was a different um, mode of both e exaggeration and reduction in specific kinds of objects. And the last one, as a shout out to Donna Haraway, is actually real and imagined robots imagined as, as Asian women. Any other remarks for the four of you? If not, I'll open it up. There's already a hand in um, the participants list. And I just want to remind everybody, do it by raising your hand, which is in the reactions button. So let's start with Jennifer. Jennifer, I think I you're just finding my okay. Yeah, I was just finding my unmute button. Sorry, I started okay. and then I realized um, I wanted it. So that was amazingly wonderful, everybody. Um, I, I feel like I have 50 questions, but I'm just going to ask one. And I'm going to uh, ask it of, of Leslie, but I would be delighted to hear if other folks on the panel would like to respond. I was really enjoying, since I also write about material culture and race, I was really enjoying the thinking about um, the way these ideas also apply to so many other kinds of uh, objects from um, different kinds of cultural stereotypes, obviously Mexican American and African American. And I was thinking about the sort of cross racial materiality and who profits from it. In other words, I was trying to expand the question to this broader scope that Leslie, you gestured toward, which was a kind of racial capitalism that's um, international. So for example, Alessi, I believe is an Italian design company and they're the ones that partnered with the, um, the juicer, I believe. And um, uh, the artist Pepo Nosorio also explores the origins of these plastic air filters, um, air fresheners that look like a black power fist. And he did some research to find out that the folks who reproduced those were um, white um, art collectors in New York. And so thinking about the relationship of sort of profit flows and the circulation of these objects and who profits from selling them, I think is a really interesting part of the story that I'd love to hear more about if in fact you're thinking on those lines. And then I'd also like to ask another question enfolded in that, which is clearly part of the role of these objects is to precisely not be cross-racial identify identifiers. In other words, they're part of maintaining tight uh, boundaries around racial types. And I wonder if you come across any objects that seem to break those boundaries or question those limits um, in your research. So fantastic, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer. And, and I wanna uh, reply to the first question about capitalist flows in talking about Hallyu or the Korean wave. And so one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in now, maybe less for this work, but in, in the future, is that it, it's not simply that these figures that are anthropomorphic are um, produced in the same way that racist era kitsch, segregation era kitsch in the United States were produced because they are not necessarily meant for non-Asian audiences. They're produced in Asia and circulate in especially East Asia. And so that 
to me is a really different question when in fact some of the characters like the like the most obvious one you know or cartoon characters that came out of South Korea with the very you know slanted eyes so if you know the cartoon Puka that was a South Korean um per, uh, production that was supposed to be circulated everywhere and around the globe as part of that Hallyu or Korean wave moment. And so this idea of having desirable figures such as uh, Puka or even Hello Kitty are coming out of a, a very self-conscious desire to for East Asian countries in particular to, to hit a certain commodity flow that is a global flow that is especially about girl or women's culture. You know, so that if you think of the aesthetic that is attached to some of those figures and, and the filters also that Amy used, you know, what is the aesthetic that has become uh, associated with Japan that instills a certain kind of um, politics of care or desire or affection? And to me, that that really is about South Korea and Japan being very self-conscious about what appeals to people globally. You know, so that's the the first uh, part of the question. Um, the cross racial identifiers. It's really interesting because I'll I'll go material on this. I don't know if you know this um, uh, uh, household goods uh, manufacturer called Kierkerlen, which I think many of you know it when you see it. Uh, basically, they have design competitions around the world that are located in specific uh, countries. And so the challenge is how can you come up with a tchotchke, a household good that can convey the entirety of that culture? You know, so the the uh, the Chinese one was a little tea fisherman, you know, like the little stereotype of the Asian, you know, in, in with the conical hat and the like the robes sh fishing for tea. Right. So China, tea, conical hat, all those reproduced. And the one for Mexico, as it, if I were to ask you to guess what won the Mexican competition, it was the pinata, you know, so little chachis in the shape of the a, Pinata. So there's a way in which that is a positive association, but it also, when it gets into certain contexts, just becomes, you know, like a Halloween costume, you know, the, the revived Halloween costume. And so that's the, you know, some of these are delightful when they land in certain places, but that kind of global, local friction you know, it's not yet worked out in terms of racialization, right? So that these objects can mean completely different things in different places. So I don't, I, I don't think that there's a neat, you know, X means Y, you know, uh, in, in that kind of global flow. Thank you so much. Thanks. I wonder if Chris or Amy want to comment on the question. Um, didn't have much to say other than I was thinking about cars um, and because in among the examples that um, Leslie that you mentioned that I mean you, you you kind of made the point that it was something about like those car those ethnicized cars right um, that were that was sort of used to manage this anxiety about Japanese auto competition and so it sort of situated that within this kind of broader global frame, right? I mean, as a way of maybe taming it. And I was just curious about maybe you could, if you could say more about, about that part of your argument. Uh, yes, it, you know, and, and it goes with the question that, that Jennifer asked as well. And, and I also think that there's a certain kind of um, anxiety that is overridden by the, re the reduction of things to cuteness. And I think that that's, to me, this idea of when we talk about affect theory um, in the humanities, you know, it's very different from the way that social psychologists will talk about the forms of feeling. And I'm thinking about something like the what's called the VAD scale in psychology, valence, arousal, and domination. So you're actually measuring uh, the nature of feeling not on a single axis, but on a tripart axis, the way it makes you feel calm or in control, the way you know that it makes it has a positive or, or negative feeling, or you know, 
this that's kind of intersection when you think of the way in which some of these objects are, are circulating they're hitting a very especially when they become asianized they're hitting a very specific intersection in the vad which is they make you feel calm you feel positive about it but then you're also able to dominate right so even when Lamy was showing those filters there's a certain kind of cuteness of reduction that makes you feel in control right because they are diminutive they are adorable they are delight that you possess them right and and you take care of them and to me that is that's part of what you're talking about of how anxiety becomes allayed for the nature of not the thing itself but the feelings that the things elicit. And so that's what I was trying to get at in terms of, you know, the idea of, well, how does the thing allay anxiety? Well, it's that you have a certain kind of um, possession over it and a certain specific relationship to it when it is racialized in the United States. I see that Donna has her hand up. Donna? Yes. Uh, first, all three of you, uh, thank you. Really powerful and helpful. Um, I have two questions, but one only that I really want and a response to because there isn't time. Uh, I do have a question about the ambivalent ambivalences and complexities upon being adopted into an anti-racist white family, um, because I think they might be different in interesting ways. But what I really want to ask about to no one's surprise is dogs because I'm thinking of the international uh, racialized, regionalized uh, exchange system uh, for dogs from Taiwan in particular. Uh, I have such a dog named with a bad Mandarin name, Shindichu, from an Ursula Le Guin novella that deals with a, a colonial and imperial trans, uh, trans space flight. And I'm a member of a group, a social group, uh, that uh, has a, a really rich and multi-layered relationship to the foremost mountain dogs and the Taiwan dogs. And I think they do some of the same work as inanimate objects, but also very different work because they are actually in a genteel social partner in this. So they of course have no investment about whether they're from Taiwan or not. But I'm curious if you thought about the, um, uh, the, the issue of animals, not as symbols, but as actual partners in the context of the of racist love. Oh, that's me. Um, I have, because I was coming out of it in such a different way than you do in your species companion work, that that was certainly on, you know, the top of my mind, because I was trying to think of, you know, the objects as something that, you know, conventionally are completely written upon. And the way in which I was thinking about dogs is very similar to the way in which Marie Kondo actually talks about your own possessions. Because there, and this is what I love about Marie Kondo, is that everyone thinks her theory about um, sparking joy, things sparking joy is so way out because she's affirming this kind of Shinto belief uh, or philosophy that things are actually, that, that, that are, they're actually alive, right? They have some sort of soul, they have some sort of uh, inner being and essence and that you have to honor that essence as a, a means of having them share your space with you. And so I was thinking about what you had written about dogs in the very same way that Marie Kondo writes about things that are of your possession. So for example, you have to thank your purse, you know, for working hard for you or thank your coat for, for keeping you warm that day. And so there's all, also this notion of the aliveness of things and the reciprocity of things that underlies uh, her philosophy, which is when Chris referred to like the, the backlash that Marie Kondo gets as a part of her Asian-ness. Well, it's not only the visible physical Asian-ness that she represents, but the quote unquote craziness of affirming that your possessions are actually alive and are working on your behalf. And I thought of that very much in, in re regard to what you've written down about dogs, because it really is about well, here is your irreducible, you know, alterity to me and your, you know, your essence that is alive, the essence that you are sharing yourself with me. And so I was thinking of that in, in terms of Marie Kondo 
Um, uh, and, and so that's the way I was thinking of it. I mean, of course, you know, for me, it's the cats who have been really racialized in terms of Asia and the whole, you know, way in which we may or may not graft human meaning onto the Burmese, the Siamese, the Abyssinian, the, the, and I keep going, you know, with, with cat species. And I think that it's very specific why cats have been Asianized as opposed to dogs. And it has to do with the way we're graphing felineness onto human beings as opposed to canineness. You know, so I, that's the other thing I was thinking. I'd also be happy to respond to the idea of an anti-racist white family. Uh, this is something that we talk a lot about in adoption activism and studies of, of you know, the, um, the premise of, uh, of not all white or transracial families being problematic. And I would say that um, relatively speaking for the 1980s, my white mother was really progressive. She was a teacher of, of children with special needs and special ed um, and an advocate for them. And, and I think that really translated to a lot of um, the way she taught and, and embodied a, a sense of self-worth for me and my brother growing up. However, I, I often say that this never makes up for the, the loss and the trauma of my family in Korea. And it never makes up for the grief and the, the trauma that my Korean mother, my Oma experienced. Um, and so I do think more families are understanding an idea of being anti-racist in our present day, but it, as we all know, it is a process and often in hetero um, families where the woman experienced some level of in, uh, infertility, she often does not grieve that fully, and that also gets imposed uh, into the into the adopted family in these dynamics as well. And also, a lot of families have adopted in a religious or Christian sense, uh, and so again, it kind of goes back to this racist love of you know well-intended uh, you know charity, but that's also dehumanizing um, as well. So I, I've yet to to find a, an adopted person of color who feels like their family, white family, is perfectly anti-racist. Um, do a couple of the people who put their, um, well, Louise, you put a question in the chat. Do you want to say it or do you want me to translate it? I mean, I, say it. I can ask. Thank you, everyone. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just wanting to hear more about um, maybe disidentification and identification. Um, I, I, I took lots of notes during Leslie's great presentation about um, wounded coalitional identity and thinking about like, being the butt of the joke, but finding it funny, and and I would love to hear from from anyone, but um, especially uh, Amy and Leslie. Okay, yeah, unmuted. Um, so the idea of uh, wounded attachments comes from our own Winnie Brown, who wrote while she was at UCS. Uh, see about wounded attachments and so this this idea of you know how you have to cathet to the side of trauma in order to make a claim on the state is really the idea that I was thinking about there um, but then this the second part of it was the association of the effective stance associated with coalitional politics is the notion of grievance, is the notion of anger, is the, uh, is the notion of, uh, you know, uh, oppression or woundedness. And of course, you know, thinking about, well, what about the notion of positive feeling? You know, how do you begin to claim a space in that notion of politics that does it not, that does not circle you know, around that, it is not effectively replicating that one small tiny house that you're associated with. And I do think that H Helene's uh, teaching is also about magnifying those uh, alternative sites. And so I was thinking a little bit about, well, what does it mean that, you know, if you are connecting to something that you know, right, 
is meant to demean or dishonor or be, you know, part of this, you know, apparatus of differentiation, you know, how, how then do you yourself connect to it? And it reminds me of this piece uh, by, uh, I think, Leonard Savior, and, and the title is something like, you know, when is a Jewish joke not anti-Semitic? You know, and basically his answer is when it's told about Jews by Jews and to Jews, right? So there's this notion of this closed circuit in which you can have something positive, like a sense of humor that is also really affirming to who you are internally, right? And it's not relying on this external friction or tension to say, I am not what you say that I am. It's actually in a closed circuit of the people who know, you know, what and share what is something that is pleasurable or funny or humorous. And it really is getting at that tension when I use the word that Chris pulled out, which is the idea of self affirmation. You know, what are the ways and where do you begin to look for that outside the notion of wounded attachment? And so it was really kind of thinking about along those lines where even starting with as Chris you said, you know, this, you know, I'm like breaking into a sweat when I'm talking about a lot of these things because it goes so counter, right? Even the use of Amy's filters, right? Counter to what people think you are supposed to do and say, which is like, a, you know, a, a single tiny thing. And to me, it was really like, okay, well, what about that juicer? That's kind of cute. I like that. That's funny. It's supposed to be me. It looks just like me, you know? And to me, uh, looking at these sites where you can actually say, well, how can we think outside of the way our collectives are managed by other people and how we then take control of that, rest it, and have those things mean something different and affirm a different, you know, effective emotional valence to those things as well. Did you want to comment, Amy? Sure. And I think I can loop in uh, Jennifer's question as well. Um, I think for transracial adoptees or adopted folks, um, you know, they're dealing with this kind of racial humor and being the butt of jokes and n very isolated away from other adopted folks of color. Um, there's a wild statistic and I don't have the, the citation for it, but um, transracially adopted kids of color are more likely to be raised in white in neighborhoods than white kids, which is a class thing partially, of course, but there's a lot of isolation that happens. And so the idea of being raised by folks who are making jokes, um, everything from like, and microaggressions of all, of all sorts. So, you know, being like, oh, if you act up, we're gonna, you know, send you back to where you came from. And these types of jokes that parents, their racial anxiety, they don't really know how to deal with this. They haven't had experience. Um, and I do think this overlaps with biracial families when there is a white parent versus a kid of color, absolutely. Uh, and often these kids don't know where to go. So what happens is um, the love that is supposed to be in this family is, is actually literally very conditional on adopted kids um, not pushing up against these things or, or um, trying to, to advocate for themselves. Well, we're getting close to the time when um, we all get to take um, a short break to um, exercise our limbs, sorry about the dings, um, and to um, return for another talk and another panel. And um, uh, uh, Donna or I a little while ago gave you um, the links to um, some strange and funny exercises. Um, here she goes again, good. Um, and uh, one of which Leslie mentioned in her talk. Um, and we're gonna reconvene at 12.50, um, but I wanted to thank this group of people for a really exciting and amazing and stimulating set of um, interventions. Thank you all so much.
And I, can I just say thank you so much, Carla, for moderating and to Donna also for, for all your work on this conference and to Seth for his wonderful presentation uh, yesterday. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll see you in 20 minutes, everybody. Bye.
Hello, everybody. Um, Hello. Hello, Pamela. Or um, Jennifer. Um, I think we can remove the slide, Jason. All right, sounds good. Hello. Hello. Welcome back, everybody. We'll just start in a, in a minute. Let's let people have a chance to return. It's still 1249, according to my estimates. So Daniel Young, if you can turn the mute on your um, computer, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Trying to get in a good position here. <laughs> so if we're all uh, reassembled, I'm looking at the view, letting some people come back in. Looks like we're mostly here. Um, I hope you all had a good stretch and a good break. And we're gonna get started on the second half of our afternoon. Welcome, welcome back everybody to Writing for Living, the Helene Moglen Conference in Feminism and the Humanities. My name is Jennifer Gonzalez and I will be the moderator for this afternoon's panel. I was lucky enough to be a representative to Women's Studies Department when I was a graduate student in the History of Consciousness program in the late 1980s when Helene was active in the program and when I returned to Santa Cruz as a professor, joy to work with Helene and other campus feminists at the Institute for Advanced Feminist Research. And it's really wonderful to see some of you out there today, both from the time when I was a student and um, as a faculty member. I'd like to begin with a quick land acknowledgement. Also, UC Santa Cruz is located on the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Uki tribe, the Amamuts and Trammel Band, comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions, Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. Before I introduce this afternoon's keynote speakers, I want to remind folks about the auto transcription option. If you click the CC box, the closed caption box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can enable automatic transcription and second, unless you are asking a question or presenting a paper, please mute yourselves. This is important. I will be introducing the keynote speaker, Susan Derwin, and then we will run a pre-recorded video of the talk, about 35 minutes, after which I will introduce the respondents who will each speak live for eight to 10 minutes. After the respondents speak, I'll ask Susan, Dee, and Brenda whether they have questions or comments for each other. And then the floor will be open for questions from any one of you. I will be monitoring the Q&A. And if you have a question, please use the raise hand function. You can also put your question in the chat. And I will try to keep an eye on that as well. I am very pleased to introduce Susan Derwin, who is Professor of German and Comparative Literature and Director of UC Santa Barbara's Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. Her books include The Ambivalence of Form, Lukács, Freud, and the Novel, and Rage is the Subtext, Readings in Holocaust Literature and Film. She has also published articles and chapters on European and American narrative, and most recently on moral injury and on the challenges military veterans face when they return to the civilian world. In 2018-19, she was a visiting fellow in Germany at the University of Yelfield Center for Interdisciplinary Research as a part of an international group studying the topic guilt as culturally productive force. At UC Santa Barbara's Humanities Center, she has developed a series of community-engaged humanities initiatives, such as 
Foundations in the Humanities, a correspondence program in literary studies for people who are incarcerated in California, and Interpreters in Our Local Schools, a program that uh, trains bilingual university students to work in public elementary schools as interpreters during parent-teacher conferences. Please join me in welcoming Susan Derwin. Jason, can you please start the video? I'm not getting for Chero Seth. Let me begin by thanking Donna Haraway, Sheila Namir, Carla Frichero, Seth Moglin, and Jennifer Gonzalez for creating the opportunity for us to come together to reflect upon and continue to learn from Helene Moglin's life and her work and to mark our shared loss. It is an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you. I first met Helene Moglin at Lake Arrowhead in 1993 during the inaugural gathering of the UC Interdisciplinary Psychoanalytic Consortium. I was a beginning assistant professor of literature, uneasy about the prospect of spending the weekend with a group of mostly senior psychoanalytic scholars and practitioners, all luminaries in their fields. Helene was one of them. I was familiar with her books on Lawrence Stern and Charlotte Bronte, and as a literary scholar myself, I was particularly excited and nervous about the prospect of sitting around the same conference table as Helene. At the beginning of the first day of the meetings, we each introduced ourselves. When it was her turn, Helene shared that she approached psychoanalysis and all theory as a genre of storytelling akin to fiction. I remember feeling intrigued by the singularity of her perspective and impressed by her boldness in sharing it. After all, there were clinicians in the room, people of science. Helene's words and the note of levity she introduced into the conversation put my mind at ease. One memory encapsulates the impression she made upon me that weekend. She was wearing beautifully crafted earrings and beads. They were so intricate, so inviting of conversation. They were just like Helene. In the years that followed, Helene and I regularly attended those annual consortium meetings, and we became friends. We subsequently co-chaired the program committee for a number of the annual meetings, and we collaborated on other projects and workshops. In 1997, we designed and led a two-day faculty seminar through the UC Humanities Research Institute on mourning and melancholia. Helene and Sheila took part in a conference I organized on narrative making in the aftermath of war. Finally, Helene, Sheila, and I taught together in the UC Veterans Summer Writing Workshop. Helene and I discussed and shared our work. She read mul multiple drafts of my second book manuscript, steering me out of impasses, telling me always, persist in writing your truth. Discovering her truth was why Helene wrote. I love to write, she told me. I love the well-made sentence. I love to have my mind engaged. She was drawn to the desk each morning by the prospect of exploring the edges and planes of her multifaceted self and finding release from her own boundedness. I believe that is why, for her, writing made living possible. During one period in her life, when immediate cares kept her from her desk, she told me that there had arisen in her a compensatory need, quote, to be engaged, to be doing something of some value, to be with people, to be feeling my own competence. It was then that she developed a creative writing course for student veterans at UC Santa Cruz. She had been inspired by, the, by a presentation she had heard in May of 2009 at the Psychoanalytic Consortium meetings. As the program chairs that year, we had invited two analysts to discuss their organization, The Soldiers Project, which was a network of volunteer therapists working with Iraq and Afghanistan veterans and their families. Judith Broder, the organization's founder, and Tom Helsher, a board member, were the speakers. Their presentation inspired Helene to organize a writing workshop for the coming fall. But as she later recalled, quote, despite extensive publicity, nobody came. 
campus staff surmised that veterans who were enrolled at the university were already eager to get on with their lives. They wanted neither to dwell on the past nor to be identified retrospectively with the military, especially not in a progressive community like Santa Cruz. Not to be discouraged, two years later, Helene approached the commander of a local Veterans of Foreign Wars post about the possibility of the post sponsoring such a workshop for local veterans. Although the commander was extremely supportive, he and his colleagues were, uh, colleagues were also nervous about how Helene would react if anyone melted down. It was in that context that Sheila, a psychoanalyst, offered to teach the workshop with her, which they did in the summer of 2012. Back in 2009, when Broder and Helscher spoke at the consortium, I was in the process of writing a book about Holocaust testimonies. I wanted to understand why it had been, it had been so imperative for survivors to communicate to non-survivors about what Charlotte Delbo had referred to as the, quote, useless knowledge that had been revealed to her as a prisoner in Auschwitz. As survival Primo Levi had written, quote, the need to tell our story to the rest, to make the rest participate in it, had taken on for us, before our liberation and after, the character of an immediate and violent impulse, to the point of competing with our other elementary needs." End quote. The Holocaust had rent the fabric of European life, plunging Levy into an existential freefall. Storytelling, it turned out, promised to arrest the momentum of that fall. Communicating his experiences to others, witnessing his stories being received, gave him hope that Auschwitz had not extinguished, in his word, the divine spark within. Psychoanalyst Dory Laub writes, quote, there is in every survivor an imperative need to tell and thus to come to know one's story. One has to know one's buried truth in order to be able to live one's life." End quote. Laub's emphasis on telling one's story to know one's story speaks to yet another consequence of narrative making. It produces a knowledge of one's past self that enables one to live in the present and future. It enables continuity of self. For Laub, telling one's story is telling it to another, knowing one's story and representing it so that another can receive it are inseparable. When Holocaust survivor Jean Amery found his writerly voice 25 years after his camp liberation, he, he described how, quote, a gloomy spell appeared to be broken. Suddenly everything demanded telling and everything demanded to be told in the first person. End quote. Accessing the, first, the position of the first person pronoun, Amari experienced himself as the subject of his own history. He discovered the power of agency by narrating to others the trauma of having had his agency usurped by his Nazi tormentors. When I heard Broder and Helscher speak about their work with veterans of the recent wars, I could not help but think about the similarities between the experiences of veterans and of Holocaust survivors. Like survivors, veterans had inhabited spaces outside the bounds of the ordinary world, war zones, but more broadly, the military as an institution. And like Helene, I became inspired to develop a writing workshop for student veterans at UC Santa Barbara. I prepared for two years. I read memoirs, poetry, and fiction written by veterans who had deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the emerging clinical research on the impact of modern war. I took part in the training the Soldiers Project provided for therapists, and I spent a week at Georgetown University observing their veterans writing program. I also contacted Tom Helscher, who expressed an interest in meeting to discuss the literature I was reading. We began to do so, sometimes twice a month, a practice we've continued to this day. When I met with the campus veterans coordinator and told her about my plan to start a workshop, she sprang from her chair and embraced me, 
She knew only one faculty member, a military historian, who had offered any support to the veteran population on our campus. This was consistent with the results of a 2010 national survey about student welfare, which revealed that the 11,000 student veterans they had surveyed overwhelmingly felt that they received less support and that they were less engaged with faculty than students on campus who had not served in the military. In preparing for the workshop, Vivian Gornick's book, The Situation and the Story, about the structure of the personal essay was especially useful to me, as was psychologist James Pennebaker's research on the value of expressive writing as a means of recovering from trauma. Pennebaker notes that for people who have experienced trauma, not putting experience into words is itself burdensome because it requires maintenance of the stress-inducing vigilance that the keeping of secrets requires. My objective in facilitating the classroom discussions was going to be to stay focused on what I knew best, the mechanics of personal narratives, while taking part in the classroom conversations as a neutral, non-invasive civilian listener. The first time I taught the workshop, four students enrolled. Since then, I have taught the class well over a dozen times with about seven or eight students enrolled each time. In 2015, with the help of Sheila, Helene, and Tom, I launched a five-day intensive summer workshop for 24 veterans from across the UC system. And my remaining comments today will be based upon the experience I have accumulated over the last 10 years, working with student veterans in my class and during our ongoing summer program. The veterans who have taken part in these workshops have served in the Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Navy, and Coast Guard. A few were in Special Forces, they were Green Berets, Rangers, and Navy SEALs. Others were reservists. Some have a spouse who is active duty, which makes the student both a veteran and a military dependent. Some remained in the U.S. during their enlistment, many deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, or both, while others to the Indian Ocean or Okinawa. They range in age from 24 through 53, and most of them, but not all, are from California. A, a few grew up on military bases, and as children, they moved every two years to different parts of the country. They do not consider any one place their home. Some, children of farm workers, were born in the Central Valley. One from Yuba City is a member of the Sikh community. Many came from underserved urban neighborhoods, the Mission District in San Francisco, South Los Angeles, or poor neighborhoods in Bakersfield, Stockton, and Fresno. Some enlisted as a way out of gang culture. A former army artilleryman joined to avoid a jail sentence. They have held many kinds of jobs in the military, working as mechanics and engineers, fighter pilots and military police, corpsmen and medics, gunners and snipers. Many had desk jobs or performed everyday tasks. A Navy veteran, veteran spent a month in the prison of an aircraft carrier. An Army infantryman who took part in the 2003 invasion of Iraq became homeless after his service and spent three male, months in jail. A Marine was served divorce papers the day after he completed his last tour of duty. An Air Force veteran who hated his corrupt command finished his service and went to work as a military contractor for the Royal Saudi Arabia Air Force, where he found the corruption to be even worse. Notwithstanding their varied backgrounds and histories, the participants have something in common. They are all university students and therefore in a stage of their lives and in an environment that mitigates against introspection and self-reflection, especially about their military service. Almost all of them have separated from the military, which means that they have established varying degrees of psychological distance from or proximity to their military past. Many students in the workshop have related that their campus instructors and fellow classmates have openly expressed to them their low regard for the military, 
which is one reason why these students do not openly identify themselves as veterans. Given all of this, it's not surprising that the students who enroll in the workshop often do so hesitantly. Recall that no one came to Helene's workshop the first time she offered it. And the students are frequently reluctant at first to disclose much about their service. Their attitudes, though, tend to change over time. In the military, they were trained to operate as a team. They know how to help others. They work well together as a group. They are generous with their support of one another. It is not uncommon for the workshop participants to experience something like a breakthrough at the midpoint of the course, usually once they discover something new about themselves, such as a feeling they hadn't realized they'd been carrying. At the beginning of the course, I discuss with the participants how writing personal narrative lends control over memory. I characterize the creation of narrative structure as a process of externalization, and I encourage the students to consider literary form as a container or holding space for their memories. The writing process itself, I suggest, will enable them to establish emotional and intellectual space between themselves and their memories, so that from their perspectives as narrators in the present, they can explore the meaning of their past experiences. I also emphasize that they are in control of the writing process itself, as both the subjects and objects of their stories. They have the power to control how inward they want to go and to step back should they feel overwhelmed. The workshop is structured around a series of prompts, sequenced to be increasingly complex, thematically, and compositionally. The early prompts specify what the writer should focus on, such as a significant object or a discrete event, such as a homecoming. Sometimes the prompt steers the writers to a point of entry into a memory, specifying, for example, to begin by recalling a particular sensory experience. More advanced prompts ask the writer to experiment with alter alternative perspectives, for example, by narrating an experience from an imagined first-person perspective of someone else who is present on the scene. Each week, the participants bring copies of their essays to the class and distribute it to the others. We discuss each piece, and afterward, the writers produce a second draft of their story, taking into, consider into consideration the feedback they have received. The rewritten texts are made available for everyone to read on a class blog. <clears throat> Working with veterans, I am often reminded of a scene in Eric Remarque's German World War I novel, The Road Back. The narrator, who has just returned from the trenches, describes the impact of combat upon soldiers. He writes, quote, In ourselves we are still chaste, but our imagination has been undermined without our being aware of it. In German, the literal meaning of the word undermined, zersetzen, is to be torn into pieces. War, the narr narrator says, destroys or tears to pieces the imagination of the warrior. War has the ability to destroy the warrior's imagination and with it, his capacity for empathy. Empathy draws upon the ability to imagine the experience of the other. But in combat, when the other is the enemy, that ability is a liability. Empathy towards the enemy other militates against immediate and decisive action against the other. That is why empathic imagining must be forestalled. The preconditions of empathy are interiority and separateness. These are qualities that undermine combat readiness. That is why the conditioning of warriors consists in dissolving the boundaries of their individual egos so that they can be merged into an invincible military unit. As J. Glenn Gray describes, when part of a unit, the individual passes insensibly into a we. My becomes our. An individual fate 
loses its central importance. Wilfred Bion, who was a tank commander during World War I and then became a psychoanalyst, wrote that the merging of the self with a larger unit serves, quote, as a potential bulwark against becoming traumatized, end quote. The merging of the I into the we enables intense attunement to the present. The narrator of The Road Back recalls the following about combat, quote, we were accustomed to think swiftly, to act on the instant, another minute, and all might be over forever, end quote. According to Helen MacDonald, to be able to kill requires, quote, a radical change in subjectivity. The world dissolves to nothing, end quote. All service members, regardless of whether they have deployed to combat zones, have been conditioned to achieve such a state of hyper-presentness. This conditioning, however, is not thoroughgoing. The self's absorption into the group is never total. For when the boundedness of the ego releases, traces of unprocessed individual experience, what Bion calls beta elements, leave their imprint on the warrior's mind. Narrative making serves as a means of accessing those traces and rendering them meaningful. By writing, the veterans in the workshop transform the raw material of their impressions and feelings into meaningful expression. In so doing, they regain a sense of individual agency. One participant noted about this experience, quote, when I formulated my memories into a coherent account and verbalized what my senses told me, a clearer picture appeared that I could mold, keep, burn or share, all at my choosing and by my hand. In describing the transformation he experienced, another participant commented, quote, the images and memories of war that I have carried with me since I started my transition from the military to civilian life have been lifted and released into my writings, helping me express what has been trapped in my head through a creative and boundless approach. I'd like now to offer two examples of such a transformation of raw material into meaningful story. And while my brief accounts cannot capture the specific narrative and rhetorical practice, practices that enacted these transformations, I hope they can provide a sense of how the crafting of narrative reveals to the writer who they were at the time of the events they recalled from the perspective of who they had become at the time of writing. A Navy veteran wrote about his ship's engagement with Somali pirates. His ship had been sent to fend off the pirates' sudden attack of a cargo vessel. As the ship headed toward the vessel in the Indian Ocean, the sailor, a gunner, felt excited by the prospect of imminent battle. But by the time the ship arrived at the scene, Two fighter planes were already bombing the Somali boat, and there was nothing for the sailors to do but watch the assault. When it was over, the crew spotted a lone surviving Somali bobbing in the ocean, bleeding profusely. The crew picked him up, but the Somali's wounds were severe, and he later died. When the mission was happening, the student had felt extremely disappointed that he had missed an opportunity to get in on the fighting. But for a long time after the event, the images of the wounded man would flash uncontrolled through his mind, which he attributed to the fact that the Somali was the first person he had ever seen die. When he wrote about the experience, he discovered his feelings of empathy for the Somali. What he couldn't see at the time of the battle, he saw now, that he, the enemy, was a person doing what he could and all he could to survive. In another piece of writing, a Marine veteran recalls going back to his hometown to visit his closest childhood friends. His friends, he found, were spending their days doing exactly what they had done in high school, play video games and smoke pot. This disturbed the Marine. His friends also gave him grief for his high and tight haircut, 
but he took their teasing good-naturedly. Initially, when he applied himself to writing about this episode, he thought he was composing a light-hearted story about seeing old buddies. His tone was jovial. Upon reflection, though, he realized that the trip home had marked the beginning of a painful rupture with his friends, and that adopting a light-hearted tone was a disguise for the anger he in fact felt towards them. He also discovered the sadness he felt over losing his connections to the friends he had grown up with. Like Holocaust survivors, warriors have first-hand knowledge of what journalist David Wood describes as, quote, an alternate moral universe where many of the rules and values we grew up with are revoked, end of quote. According to veteran Carl Marlantes, serving in a war zone where the prohibition on killing is suspended, then returning to the civilian world, which is predicated on the same prohibition, creates, quote, a deep split in the soldier's psyche. Marlantes notes that society fails to recognize that this psychic split is caused by the very killing it has asked soldiers to do on its behalf. And as a result of this societal, societal failure, Marlantes writes, quote, warriors carry a psychological and spiritual weight most of them will stumble beneath the rest of their lives. They must learn how to integrate the experience of killing, to put the pieces of their psyche back together again. But for the most part, they have been left to do this on their own, end of quote. The recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were fought by an all-volunteer force. As a result, civilians have been able to forget these wars or, as Wood notes, quote, to ricochet between lazy indifference to the war fighting and overwrought hero worship of returning troops, end of quote. This erratic, cursory engagement has consequences. For if civilians do not commit to imagining their way into these other worlds, veterans cannot construct the larger frameworks of meaning they need to come to terms with the impact of having served in these morally fraught situations. Our country has left the work of reckoning with the moral implications of the recent wars to those who fought them. And while not all veterans choose to speak with civilians about their military experience, if they feel socially prohibited from doing so, their silence can become caustic. In this regard, moral injury and the high suicide rate among veterans of the recent wars are symptomatic of the country's failure to, to engage in exploring the meaning of the recent wars. Journalist Sebastian Younger has written about the value of shared public meaning in helping soldiers to integrate their wartime experiences into their larger life narratives. According to Younger, quote, shared public meaning gives soldiers a context for their losses and their sacrifice that is acknowledged by most of society. After running the workshop for three years, it became clear that UCSB student veterans had no sense of a shared public context for their service. So in 2014, I suggested to my class that we organize a public reading so that they could have the experience of being recognized and acknowledged by the community for their service. Everyone liked the idea except one student, a 10-year Navy veteran who subsequently wrote an essay about his reservations. In the piece, he discussed how strangers who saw him in uniform had asked him if he had ever shot anyone and how someone in a restaurant told him he would go to hell for what he represented. Other people assumed he had enlisted in the military because he was a juvenile delinquent. His resistance to the idea of sharing his work with an audience of strangers was therefore not surprising. Eventually, though, he decided to take part in the reading, I believe, because writing down his reservations had created space inside of him for more hopeful feelings to emerge. He wanted to connect with civilians in a meaningful way. 
The reading took place on campus with 40 people from the community present, including some students and faculty members. The veterans were nervous. One made sure to sit next to the door in case he changed his mind at the last minute. But they had rehearsed many times and could almost recite their work from memory, which strengthened their confidence. The living voices of the veterans lent an intensity to the stories they read that visibly moved the audience. After the reading, the writers sat together at the front of the room for a discussion with the audience. Unprompted, the initially reluctant Navy veteran assumed the role of moderator. The audience was forthcoming in its expressions of gratitude, respect, and appreciation of the quality of the writing. The local newspaper asked to publish the stories, and all of the veterans were enthusiastic about the idea. The summer workshop in, in which Helene and Sheila talked for two years also included a public reading. At one point, Helene shared with me some concerns she had about the event. Because she recognized that the writing process could leave veterans emotionally raw, she felt protective of the workshop participants. She worried that by sharing their work with others, they might feel too exposed. But she also recognized that veterans want to be heard by people who are not veterans. Helene's concerns made me mindful of the irresolvable tension that exists between the introspective and the communicative aspects of writing about trauma and of the importance of sustaining a balance between the two. It is in the spirit of this balance that the workshop continues as I strive to infuse it with Helene's gentleness and humor her fierce attentiveness to the vulnerabilities of those who take part in it, and her firm belief that writing does make living possible in ways she and I experienced working together with veterans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. There's so much to talk about there, but I will move on quickly to introducing our two respondents and I will be introducing them in the order in which they will be speaking. Um, our first respondent will be Dee Hibbert Jones. Dee Hibbert Jones is an Academy Award nominated, Emmy Award winning filmmaker and artist. Her work examines power and politics, how people manage and who gets heard. Her most recent animated documentary film, of Freedom, as well as her current feature film, In Progress, explore the crisis in the criminal justice system and the U.S. racial divide from the perspective of families of prisoners on death row. Dee collaborates with her partner, Nomi Talisman. Together, they interview, edit, and animate. Their short film was made up of 30,000 individual drawings. They started their work with the families of prisoners on death row 15 years ago as a result of Nomi's first job out of art school, producing court media for death penalty cases. Last Day of Freedom was used to influence Governor Newsom's moratorium on, ex on executions in the state of California. Dee and Nomi were awarded a United States Congressional Black Caucus Veterans Brain Trust Award in recognition for their outstanding national commitment to civil rights and social justice and the California Public Defenders Gideon Award for support to uh, indigent minorities. Hibbert Jones is a Guggenheim Fellow. She is a professor of art and affiliate faculty in the film, legal studies and digital art new media programs at UC Santa Cruz. Our other respondent is Dr. Brenda Sanfilippo, who is a lecturer in the UCSC Writing Program, Literature Department, and Stevenson and Porter Colleges. Her research, which focuses on contemporary representations of war, is enriched by her previous experiences as an army wife to a combat veteran. She brings both academic and experiential knowledge to her current work teaching cultural competency workshops for faculty and staff working with student veterans. When she isn't teaching, 
Brenda is busy managing Zoom Middle School for her son, cleaning up after her younger daughter's art projects, cuddling with the family dog, and enjoying her husband's cooking. She is often found with a cup of tea and a book, singing along to musicals or watching her beloved Golden State Warriors. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming both of our moderators and I turn the floor over to Dee Hibbert-Jones. I'm deeply honored to be here as a respondent to Susan Derwin's paper, Writing for Veterans. Thank you to Donna Haraway, Sheila Namir, Carla Fracero, Jennifer Gonzalez and Seth Moblin for creating this opportunity to honor and remember Helene Moblin. Thank you too to my co-presenters for this incredibly moving presentations last night and earlier today. I'm learning so much from this extraordinary event. Who knew I'd be reminded of my um, master's degree in women's studies from England uh, and also from my first degree in literature and um, actually get um, resources for my um, class on art and politics that I'm teaching right now from the lectures we had this morning. So thank you for all that. Sadly, I missed the opportunity to know Helene personally. I know her through her work and through the rich and varied stories I've heard from my colleagues and friends at like at UC Santa Cruz. And I've benefited so much from all she did at UCSC without actually even knowing the safety, the intellectual stimulation and the place for women like me. It's been a pleasure to learn through Susan's paper of Helene's kindness, her generosity, her fearless approach to her practice and of her multifaceted self as Susan so beautifully puts it. We've heard so much about Helene's daily writing practice. Susan describes how the act of writing the practice of it informed Helene's life, that writing makes living possible. Thinking of writing as practice, I'm reminded of the words of architect Nabil Hamdi. He involves communities in participatory planning to create buildings that they then live within. And he says, practice disturbs. It can and does promote one set of truths, belief systems, values, norms, powers, and gender relations in place of others. It can impose habits, routines, and technologies that may lead to new and unfamiliar ways of thinking, of doing, organizing, locally, nationally, and even globally. Susan vividly describes the ways Helene understand, understand writing, or understood writing as storytelling, as interpretation, as a way to define consciousness and empower. That Helene was able to translate her investment in the written articulation of personal experience into her desire to help others write their truth as a testament to her general is a testament to her generosity of spirit, her belief that writing can be a resistance to silencing and marginalization. Sheila spoke so tenderly of the way Helene encouraged everyone she met to write. Their workshops for local veterans, taught by Helene and Susan and continued through the program at UC Santa Barbara developed by Susan, is an extraordinary manifestation of, as Helene herself described it, the power to relearn, return survivors to the human fold. Offering writing as resistance to silencing and marginalization, Susan gives us insight into her own admirably deep commitment to this practice. Susan described this as writing one's own, own narrative into existence with veterans at UC Santa Barbara. Her moving and uncomfortable descriptions of the reception veterans receive in academia reminds me how frequently we gloss over and resist acknowledgement of the pains of others and of ourselves, but most especially those who serve in wars on our behalf. Our culture's narratives of soldiers are, and actually my partner Nomi, who is a veteran from Israel, from Israel, from the military there, actually told me this. So I put this in on her behalf. Are often defined as victors, impenetrable, impregnable, male, and beyond feeling, devoid of individual identity. In contrast, narratives of the wounded or emotionally hurt are complex, undefined and unbounded. There's little space between these two hollow narratives for veterans to define themselves. Post-traumatic stress disorder was not even a part of the DSM, the Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual, uh, or defined as a mental illness until 1980. I'm reminded that many wounds suffered by veterans can continue to be hidden, left uh, as Bill Babbitt, who's the subject of my most recent short film, described it as chasing shadows. His veteran, van veteran brother, Manny, um, he's describing his experience. I love Susan's description of the writing process that she and Sheila and Helene developed as lending control over memory, of the narrative structure as a process of externalization, offering veterans the opportunity to establish emotional, emotional space for, for their experiences. This resonates deeply with my own work with the families of prisoners on death row as they tell and retell their stories over time with me as I interview them for the films I make. 
reading Susan's moving descriptions of her university student veterans as they experience a midterm break and the ways they, uh, 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 their experiences uh, during midterm and the ways they support one another through the course, I'm reminded of Jenny Edkin's Circuit of Trauma from the Trauma and Memory of Politics. She says, who we are and who we think we may be depends very closely on the social context in which we place and find ourselves. Our experience relies not only on our personal survival as individual beings, but also in the very profound sense on the continuance of the social order that gives our existence meaning and dignity. If that order betrays us in some way, we survive in the sense of continuing to live as physical beings, but the meaning of our existence is changed. Any illusion of safety and secure or security is broken. Humanity is defined through our relationships. And that's so much of part what I've been hearing from this, uh, from this uh, um, seminar today has been incredible. The practice of writing together then allows these veterans the opportunity to witness themselves and each other and to recreate a place of safety. Susan Derman describes her own research on Holocaust testimonies as the imperative for survivors to communicate to non-survivors, describing the ways that public readings offer a reintegration of individual traumatic experiences into the public sphere and having it reflected through the reception of others. This puts me in mind of the testimonies of families I've interviewed as they retell their stories and manage the trauma of their experiences as families of prisoners condemned to death. My partner and filmmaker Nomi Talisman and I work in close collaboration with a nonprofit organization, Community Resource Initiative, CRI. They're mitigation specialists who help craft the defense testimonies if prisoners accused of a capital crime. Most of CRI's clients suffer severe mental trauma, many are veterans. The lawyers and investigators at CRI speak of rehearsing testimony, witnessing and retelling the past. They coach prisoners, witnesses and family members to retell their stories in court. CRI told me that juries who learn the personal stories of the accused in death penalty cases rarely pass death sentences. Storytelling promotes empathy. Heather Love, writing about queer suffering in her introduction to feeling backward, defines the relationship between emotion and politics and moral injury. She says, the challenge is to engage with the past without being destroyed by it, but it is the damaging aspects of the past that tend to stay with us, and the desire to forget may itself be a symptom of haunting. The practice of writing, Susan and Helene tells us, provides an evolution of context, offering a space for new perspectives. Storytelling, akin to fiction, opens up orthodoxies, questions limits, and allows us empathy not through a flattening or morality, but through complexity, ambiguity, and a fullness of perspective that reveals our interdependence. Susan ends her essay by remembering Helene's gentleness and humor, her attentiveness to others. And I'm aware, as I hear Susan's tribute, that I'm witness to a deep relationship between two women who share a rigor, intellect, and generosity towards the fate of others, rendered tangible through the act of writing. Thanks. And sorry for all the Mission Street kind of like background noise. <laughs> Brenda, you're up. Oh, uh, wonderful. Can you hear me? Okay, good. And my children have left me alone all day, which means they're almost certain to start being loud the moment that I'm talking. <laughs> uh, I want to start by thanking Donna Haraway, Seth Moglen, Sheila Namir. Carla Frichero, Jennifer Gonzalez, and the staff for creating this space to honor Helene. Thank you to Susan for your brilliant, insightful, and compassionate work, and Dee for sharing this response with me. I am truly honored to speak and grateful to gather with you all today. I met both Susan and Helene totally separately through my interest in war writing. I first met Helene in 2008 when I began the literature PhD program at UCSC. I was a new mother who was nervous about balancing graduate school with a baby. Helene, of course, was no stranger to this concern. In her fierce, inimitable way, Helene assured me that not only would I succeed, but I would see things in my work that I wouldn't have before. What I did not talk about with her until much later was my own experiences with war. Just a few weeks earlier, my husband had come home from his second combat deployment and transitioned out of the US Army. Over five years of service, he spent more than 27 months deployed to Eastern Afghanistan, while I alternated between living at his military base in Italy and my graduate program in Los Angeles. He spent almost all of my pregnancy and our son's first year away in training or combat. As a military spouse, I lived in a constant state of anxiety and frequently internalized silence. 
complaints, fears, hopes, disappointments, you stuff them all down. Because if your soldier is thinking about you on a mission, he isn't thinking about the mission. To be a good army wife means you always put the mission first, which means yourself last, an expectation that I'm sure would have horrified Helene. In this effective economy, to use Sarah Ahmed's phrasing, bombs don't kill people, wives talking about their feelings does. This ethos of stoic and Susan described as caustic silence runs deep in service numbers in their families. Is anyone trying to get veterans to share stories like the encounters? When I first met Helene, I wasn't ready to talk about any of that. I instead started writing about the literature of the war on terror as a way to process, which is how I eventually met Susan at a conference panel on war writing. Susan put me back in touch with Helene, who was by then working with veteran writers. And so I concluded my degree much as I began it, talking to Helene this time about her work with veterans over pastries at Kelly's Bakery. I remember I was impressed by her curiosity, her empathy and deep care for veterans in her workshops, which in my experience was unusual for civilians who appreciate troops but are often unaware of veterans' concerns. Although we are still in the longest war in US history, we live in experiential, geographic, physical and psychological isolation from service members with only about 1% of the population in the military during the current wars, which is the lowest percentage since before World War II. This military civilian divide, as Susan described, has consequences for how we support wars and how we help troops reintegrate into civilian life. For faculty at universities, the ability to understand is increasingly exigent due to growing numbers of student veterans using the post 9-11 GI Bill. Student veterans face significant educational challenges as they frequently intersect with multiple vulnerable identities. They are often first generation students, but they may also be older with family responsibilities. They may also have newly acquired disabilities, which means that unlike our teenage students, they likely lack parental support and may not have much experience with how to manage their physical or mental challenges. They all come from a culture that stigmatizes anything perceived as weakness. You drink water, take a knee and suck it up. While not all have been in combat, most have had unusual teenage experiences like writing wills. Imagine what it is like then to be a former combat team leader who saw teenagers under your command get injured or killed, and now you're sitting in a real or these days a Zoom classroom with teenagers wearing pajamas and watching TikToks in the middle of class. It's hard to feel a sense of community when you can't find common ground. It is perhaps not surprising given these challenges to know that your retention and graduation rates for student veterans are often disturbingly low, with 10 to 11% fewer graduates despite the additional GI Bill support. Improving student veterans retention is complex, but we know that building community and connection is essential, as Susan learned in her meetings with the campus veterans, uh, veteran benefits coordinator. In my own work, Helene inspired me to help bridge this gap. So I developed a course on war in the arts with the generous support of then Porter Provost Sean Kylan. I also began teaching cultural competency courses at UCSC to help faculty and staff better understand and include student veterans. I have always been excited by Helene and Sheila's and Susan's workshop which build what Susan called shared public context and foster connections both between the veterans themselves and between the veterans and larger community. They also help to give veterans the vocabulary and tools to process and share their stories with others. This is no small feat as anyone familiar with the military knows that like all subcultures, service members have unique and exclusionary traditions, practices and language. In the army exercises PT and punishment is smoking. The cafeteria is the chow hall or the defac. A military blanket is a poncho liner or more typically a whoopee. Uh, Marine veteran and National Book Award winner Phil Cly has an entire short story, OIF, that relies on this knowledge of the military's rich language of acronym and the defamiliarization that a non-military reader feels when they encounter it. As more veterans participate in writing workshops, I hope too that our understanding of war will be enriched with more diverse voices alongside those of writers like Remark, Heller, O'Brien, and Cly. War writing has for too long privileged veterans of a particular race, sex, and class. That is not to say, of course, that those stories do not have value. But I see war differently when I read Mary Borden's and Ellen Lamott's Great War nursing memoirs, or Jess Goodell's and Kayla Williams' memoirs of serving in Iraq. I think about the long service of Black men and women fighting wars abroad while being discriminated against at home when I hear OIF poet Maurice DeCall describe PTSD in his poem, Shush. While writing for living, as Sheila pointed out yesterday, is not really the same as publishing. I'm excited to imagine what we will learn about war as more veterans have opportunities to write about their experiences. Supporting and amplifying veterans' voices, as Susan and Helene have done, is essential as well 
because of all the voices for more that we can never hear. As novelist and literary critic Viet Tan Nguyen points out, quote, the dead cannot speak for themselves. Their unnerving silence compels the living, tainted perhaps by a touch or more of survivor's guilt, to speak for them, unquote. In his memoir, Jarhead, published days before the second invasion of Iraq, Marine Anthony Swafford argues that, quote, the men who go to war and live are spared for the single purpose of spreading bad news when they return. The bad news about the way war is fought and why and by whom, for whom, and the more men who survive the war, the higher the number of men who might speak, unquote. German thinker Walter Benjamin, writing in the aftermath of the Great War, similarly argued that, quote, death is the sanction of everything that the storyteller can tell. He has borrowed his authority from death, unquote. In Afghanistan, two of our friends died horribly, one burned to death in an IED explosion, the other blown off a cliff by an IED. My husband nearly died when a daisy chain of IEDs failed just before hitting his vehicle. One truth I learned from the army was the role of random chance in surviving. One IED explodes and another doesn't. As veteran Kurt Vonnegut would say, so it goes. Circumstances have required me to conclude differently than I had planned last year by mentioning another moment in which war and pandemic were imbricated. A century ago, the US began to mobilize for the Great War. Soldiers crammed into tight quarters in the middle of an unusually cold winter and moving between their homes and bases and from base to base likely helped spread the flu throughout the US then took it over there with them to France and England. This flu, whose damage to lungs looked a lot like damage from toxic military gases, ultimately killed between 50 to 100 million people. More Americans died of the flu than in World War I, World War II, and the wars in Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq combined. Yet, as Elizabeth Outka has pointed out in her eerily timed 2020 book, Viral Modernism, we have rarely looked for the flu in post-war literature because dying of a virus doesn't fit the narratives of heroic sacrifice that we associate with military deaths. Brenda Shaughnessy mentioned Mrs. Dalloway yesterday, and I was shocked this summer when I reread the opening pages. I intended to write about Wolf and War, only to discover a parenthetical aside I had never noticed before about Clarissa's, quote, heart, affected, they said, by influenza, unquote. As a person interested in war, I had always seen all the war trauma and missed the other trauma caused by the pandemic. I hope it's not too instrumental to say the veteran writers have a lot to tell us right now about how to write for living, as Helene advocated. They know the physical discomfort of wearing extra protective gear and how to manage unending boredom stuck in the same place as one day blurs into the next. They know what it is like to suddenly miss a year of your life, to miss births, graduations, funerals, to only talk to family and friends over the phone or video. They know death is always present, so they must always be on guard against tiny things they cannot see that can sneak in and kill them or their friends. They know what it is to experience the effects of invisible injuries on the body of mo and mind, such as traumatic brain injuries and PTSD, the signature wounds of the current wars. But I am thinking too of the unseen chronically diseased lungs of the more than 3.5 million deployed service members who breathed in toxic chemicals, fecal matter, jet fuel, plastics, munitions, paint, and other waste from the military's open air burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. Then as now, planned military choices and unplanned viruses have damaged minds as well as lungs. Finally, they know what it is like to live with survivor's guilt and grief, to feel trauma bone deep, wondering what they could have done differently to save someone they care about. Surviving a war is of course quite different from surviving a pandemic, but that doesn't mean that veteran stories can't teach us something about healing and connection for themselves as well as for us. I consider Helene to be what Virginia Woolf called an incandescent mind. She understood that the process of finding words can bring us joy. As Seth explained in his opening talk yesterday, they can help us to convert mourning into change. As we hopefully soon exit our longest war and darkest COVID winter, I can think of no more powerful message. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to both of our respondents and um, I'm going to ask Jason to take the spotlight view off so that we can all see each other um, in the gallery view. And I'm going to um, look out for raised hands. So just to remind you, you can raise your hand by going to reactions in the bottom of your screen. If you want to ask a question, you may also um, write something in the chat and I'll try to keep an eye on that. And, um, oh, but before that, we're going to ask the respondents and the speaker if they would like to speak to each other. So let's come back 
And if it's okay with you, Jason, can you spotlight our uh, keynote speaker and our two respondents so they can have um, a quick exchange? Thank you, Jason. I'll start with a few thoughts. Um, I'll go backwards um, because I'll unload my brain from what's on top and then go down. So Brenda, uh, I'm going to go really to the end of what you said and certainly, and these are not connected thoughts, but just the things I was thinking as I heard each of you speaking. Um, it's certainly true that veterans know how to live in extraordinary or, or service members, extraordinary service circumstances. And, you know, what that made me think of is that, in fact, far be it from our society to uh, put veterans to work in ways that they could be, you know, of extreme use and in ways that would be extremely productive for them. Instead, during the pandemic, the homelessness uh, among veterans is rising. So, uh, in fact, we spend so much time talking about you know therapizing reintegration into society when in fact one of the key components of societal reintegration for veteran veterans is working and seeing that they are of value to their community so that's just one thought i had um the main thing i was thinking about is uh, when you were speaking, of course, I remember so well when you submitted your paper and I uh, put you on that panel and I was utterly delighted and you're so smart and you're, I can't remember what text you were writing on, but it was a fantastic paper. It was a panel, of, I think it was the American Comparative Literature Association in New York. We had these incredible speakers, one of whom came from, two of whom came from Iraq uh, to participate, professors from Iraq, the wars were going on very actively then. I think we had an extremely small audience, which is also indicative of something. But what really your comments reminded me of um, is not only the way you're doing the most difficult thing, which is studying a topic, not only that you're immersed in, that you're living, but we must remember that coming home from war never ends. It's not over. The process of metabolizing memory and of living with memory and of returning is a long one and so you are immersed and then coming trying to come to terms intellectually and I, I think that this is something that another I didn't talk about this but for the first four years in my workshop it was combined with veterans and military dependents and military dependents suffer from double silencing, triple silencing. There is so much emphasis placed upon, uh, understandably, um, supporting whatever emphasis there is or support veterans, but military dependents, uh, spouses, children, siblings, parents uh, are living a different kind of um, deployment and their struggles have been not really heard sufficiently. So I, you know, I, I was thinking about that. Um, interestingly, in the workshop, when in the first years when I was teaching, it was the military dependents who would often crack the ice for the veterans. They were the brave ones who came forward with their stories. And that would give the veterans the courage to speak also. So, um, it, and I remember as well that the veterans who were mixed with the dependents, all of whom were in the shared project, working on this project of you know, narrative making, um, I remember the veterans would say, we had no idea that our wife was going through this or that our mother or father, we had no idea, didn't occur to them what it took to maintain a kind of stable presence and swallow your life to support your service member. So there's a tremendous amount of learning to be done and that between dependents and service members as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for your, your comments. Um, I appreciate them deeply. And as I do yours, Dee, um, you know, the stories of the families of prisoners condemned to death and uh, the prisoners themselves just makes me, um, you know, reinforces what 
I learn, which is that the individual voice is so crucial. There's nothing like telling a group story. And any story, if it's a real story, is inimitable. Every story is different. And that's when I'm working with the veterans. I'm, I, I tell them, the story you write, and it doesn't matter if it's about, you know, getting your first haircut in boot camp. camp. Yeah, millions of people have done that. But you only experienced it one way. So it's this utter specificity of each story that has the power and the ability to connect with people who aren't aware of those stories. So I can't wait to you know, delve into your work on, on narrative because I, I know how important it is. And I know, as you mentioned um, uh, in the, uh, Jennifer, in your introduction, I have been working in the prisons for six years now and the kind of living erasure that incarcerated people feel is adds a level of devastation. There's not even the kind of ambivalent narrative of war and combat, you know, combat veterans or any kind of service member uh, connected with um, people who are incarcerated that the veterans have. So it's it's the kind of utter erasure. Um, and in the work I do with um, incarcerated people, for them, the shock is even being heard that, that 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 anybody would acknowledge them as people is sort of something they have to get over it to get on with the work so i really um i appreciate and and thank you for the work you're doing and the last thing i'll say is that when you brought up hamdi uh the architect uh and the notion that practice disturbs i think that's very important and so much of what I've learned in working with veterans is what has to be disturbed are the pat stories that they've internalized that are socially defined so that they can move beyond uh, the dismissive narratives, the, the ambivalence of the public to find their feelings, to have the courage to say, to talk about the exhilarations and the desolations of serving, sort of the complexity of everything they do to be able to hold their own ambivalence requires first that you get beyond society's ambivalence towards service members. So there's a lot of unlearning, you know, that has to go on just to make space for a voice to find itself. So that's, so thank you um, for your thoughts. I wanted to say something about the uh, multiplicity of self that we talked about because I, I mean when I was first asked whether I'd be on this panel I'm so delighted to be part of this you know had I had imagined myself in the audience not necessarily speaking and I just want to think about that in relation to the multiplicity of self I'm I've, I come from a family of conscious objectors you know I would say you know kind of queer politics you know voice and voicelessness my own personal traumas related to this um you know basically we we became we began uh, looking at the families of prisoners on death row people who are not on death row but who are condemned by by the judgment of having a family member and often consider themselves to be um uh they, the, the, their their version of what their the person is whether they committed the crime or not um is not who they know that person to be. And I just want to kind of come back to that because for me, there's something so powerful about that. And I'm really honored and kind of like slightly overwhelmed by the fact of sort of representing uh, families of prisoners on death row. I think I'm interested and care deeply about the subject and care about the end of the death penalty in this country. Um, it ended in England when I was born in 62. But, I, but I'm really um, most interested in the way that Helene was able to kind of thread the needle through these places that is kind of extraordinary for me to allow people to be someone, represent an identity, but also be all the other someones. And then especially kind of touched by that in relation to um, hearing the stories that are so personal that you're telling of both Brenda and Susan of your experiences, which are kind of behind the lines of writing these experiences and supporting others. Anyway, so that was just my experience of it. I had all these other thoughts that I thought about in terms of, you know, the storytelling, which is akin to fiction and, and this sort of fictionalized version, which is what I do, I animate everything that everyone says. So it's not even, and it's not a cartoon, but it's a way of, of actually creating these metaphoric experiences, um, as well as having people, you know, rendered completely accurately. 
Um, and then I love the idea of control over control and desire, which seems to be coming through so much here. And, and you know, imagination, which is undermined or destroyed and what Brenda was talking about, and the fact that we can kind of really look at that and think that empathy and this kind of act of, of writing, uh, um, yeah, okay, Sheila's saying that, 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 uh, that Helene wanted to say that because she was so against wars and counsel people against the draft, yeah. So yeah, thank you. I, I mean, for me, that's kind of the place I live. And so it sort of feels very strange in that I come in this, in this much more complicated place now, but I love that experience of, for me, being placed in this multiple selves, but also what um, the engagements and the deep relationships I've established with the families and people on death row has become this um, broadening of myself, my identity. And I just want to say that uh, the breadth of the um, pr presentations we've seen really has allowed me to say, wow, this one woman held all of these experiences that almost draws together a lot of things I've been really passionate about and haven't ever really been able to put together before. So thanks for that. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Brenda, do you wanna comment? Oh no, I'm just enjoying um, enjoying listening to, to both of you, but I, I don't think I have anything to add right at this precise moment, maybe in a few minutes. Okay. Well, we have a couple of, um, we have one hand up. Um, I see Daniel Young wants to ask a question and um, we also have a couple in the chat. So if Daniel would like to unmute and ask his question. Um, um, I'm, I'm un unmuted, but I'm not gonna start a video. <laughs> Would you like to? Because I, uh, <laughs> I'm over overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, Sheila, thank you uh, uh, for supporting Helena and uh, bringing their workshop <laughs> to the veterans. My group was, uh, they're not, they weren't college students. They were veterans and my concern was protecting them from uh, feminists at UCSD who wanted to use veterans as a, uh, uh, a script. And I would, could never have been wrong, more wrong uh, because they opened up uh, a whole new world for all of my <laughs> fellow breath, uh, veterans. <laughs> and I just can't forget, can't forget how grateful I am. <laughs> I'm sorry, but. No, oh, it's quite all right, Daniel. This is wonderful. I've said, it, I've said enough. But, oh, my question is, would you please continue uh, this good work and focus on the uh, Vietnam veterans and the drug addiction, drug and alcohol addiction that they brought back with them uh, when they came back from the war. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would anyone like to respond to any of that? Um, may I say something? Daniel, thank you. It was, it's, it's so moving to hear from you, um, it's overwhelming. But I also wanted to just talk about the, the film that I made with um, Bill Babbitt. Uh, Manny Babbitt was a, vet, a Vietnam veteran, came back from the war, suffered from PTSD, ended up homeless, and his brother brought him back to the West Coast. And he ended up um, uh, suffering from a PTSD attack, um, breaking into an old lady's house who was watching a, 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 um, a war movie and um, beating her and she died. Um, but my my short film, which I would ha be happy to share with you if you're if you're interested, is is basically an animation of that story, talking about the trauma that Bill feels because he turned his brother in, and actually imagining his brother would get the help he needed, um, and um, and kind of experiencing that. So I just wanted to say, and um, when I first heard that that might be the story that we were going to choose to work with from the organization, I was extremely hesitant because it felt to me like veterans on top of the death penalty was too complicated. And I am 
humbled by the amount that I learned and the way in which uh, Bill was able to tell that story, uh, which was actually able to reach so many people um, and kind of open up new possibilities for me to understand and also other people to understand the experience. So I'd be happy to share it um, and I can put it in the chat if anybody's interested. Um, Can you please do that? That would be wonderful, Dee. Can I add something too? Um, two things. One, Daniel, thank you for um, your incredibly moving comments. Um, they they just really. I'm trying not to cry now myself. Um, I, I really appreciated your your concern um, about putting veterans in a vulnerable position. Um, and and unfortunately, there have been writing workshops where. You know, that they are not handled with the care that Susan and Helene and, and Sheila have handled things. Um, or there's a horrible story from a community college in, I think it's Baltimore, where a, a veteran wrote about his experiences for a writing class in Iraq. And the teacher was so moved, she convinced him to submit it to the student newspaper. And they were moved and they published it. And then the school saw it and ended up expelling him um, because he had written about the experience of killing and how that wasn't something he wants to do anymore. And they were concerned that he was gonna be the next school shooter um, and, and they expelled him. And so trusting those stories because war stories can be, right? They can be funny and they can be traumatic and they can be everything in, you know, in between. And so, to have people that you that create a space that feels safe enough to share those stories is it's not you know that's not always what happens um also i wanted to say is you know obviously i'm not um somebody who works in in you know in drug or alcohol addiction or treatment but um the fact that ptsd was not diagnostically recognized until 1980 in the dsm and i believe um, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think it was actually recognized by the military until 1986, um, which means that we had almost 20 years of veterans coming home with forms of trauma um, and lacking structures of community. And we know that um, even now, when, when you come home with trauma, if you do not get treatment, that um, there's an entire book by, I think, Aaron Glantz um, on, uh, that features several chapters on, on you know, suicide, drug and alcohol use, that it is going to... Um, you know, it will show up in things like, um, you know, co with, you know, like drug use and alcohol as ways to sort of cope with trauma. And that's a, among the many tragedies, that is one of the biggest ones to me that for 20 years, there were people um, walking around who could not get, could not get treatment or even be recognized for what they were dealing with. And for that, I, I am really sorry that, you know, you and others of your generation had to deal with that. I just want to add that, um, you know, in the in the early 2000s, when uh, after the first invasion of Iraq, when uh, the veterans were coming back, there were no resources available because the idea was this was going to be a quick in and out hit, in and out hit. So the um, soldiers came back, and there was there were no resources for them. And um, I have, uh, in fact, uh, the prison program that I, I'm, I'm involved in, I began because one of my students, a veteran, became incarcerated. And he was uh, sentenced 20 years to life. And he, when he went into prison, he continued to write with me until he reached a point after about eight months when he wrote me and he said, um, I can't write about war anymore because when you're incarcerated, you are actively at war. And uh, one can't, the difference though is that inside he's in a maximum security prison because as a, a combat veteran, he's believed to be dangerous. Uh, so when you're um, fighting inside, it's the war of gladiators. And uh, so he stopped writing and uh, asked if I would develop a literature, a reading program for the in people on the inside so that they'd have something to talk about, some way of establishing community around something other than their, their war. And so that's how this started. And we're also, we also have a program now that we're 
piloting for incarcerated veterans, many of whom are Vietnam veterans. And I have never, and I, I have never met a group of people so desperate as the veterans who are incarcerated, who are serving uh, life sentences, who have not, some of whom went, came directly out of the war, came and went right into prison. So they had no chance to process anything from the wars and they are inside now and utterly bereft of um, means. So uh, yeah, the, the situations are just incredibly compounded when you have served in the military and you're, you're incarcerated and there is a generation of Vietnam veterans like that who are inside. I have a question here from uh, Donna far away, who asks, um, I wonder if Susan, Dee, or Brenda would want to comment on the prevalence of veterans and organizations like the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys in the context of shared narrative, in this case, a right-wing patriotic story that collects together so many in a society where shared public discourse hardly exists. And if I might add, part of my question is how, uh, what, what would be the processes for reintegrating um, the patriots, um, of, of the right wing patriots, uh, in some kind of storytelling that is less aggressive? You know, I don't know enough about the individuals really who are, who are in. The, you know, part of the right wing patriots to say anything about it, but, but it certainly makes sense to me that having a cause and a mission as part of the forgotten in our culture makes sense, makes good, makes good sense. So, um, you know, my first thoughts are this is about the failures of societal reintegration um, and a way to continue warring, to continue what they know in a you know di displaced way um, because of course anybody who served is serving in the name of this country that then drops the ball on them so uh it makes sense to me that it be that the country becomes an object of hate I mean, that seems like the next level in Elaine Moglin's work in terms of the sort of reintegration of people who feel themselves to be uh, you know, an, an alienated um, by, by the majorities or kind of like looking for affiliation and connection. I'm reminded of Elizabeth Beaumont, who's a professor here, um, uh, and uh, she was actually doing work prior to the Trump administration that was about sort of the race histories and looking at kind of like those um, kind of communities that how they came uh, many times out of smaller communities. And during the Trump administration, she was actually asked and then began to move towards the Proud Boys and to looking at the present day and this sort of shocked moment of realizing that this past that she was examining <laughs> as a sort of historian of, of a sort of social historian was now uh, coming into the present. But um, I don't think I have a great answer for that. I think this, this notion of, of belonging uh, trauma and alienation and the way that one could um, formulate or connect through that is very much the way that I've always seen creative practice. I'm also reminded, and maybe this is completely irrelevant, but the fact that many of my students will say they don't like reading. And the fact of, for me, reading was the refuge in the way that I kind of managed many traumatic things within my own kind of young life. And I wonder what that kind of like connection is, and maybe it is blogging or all those things and I'm wondering whether this is a way into that kind of possibility but purely adding random thoughts yeah and I add something too um and and like Susan with the proviso that I'm not I try not to go down that rabbit hole as much as I can because it just upsets me um but I've been doing a lot of work um this past year um because I'm teaching a, a class uh, next quarter on American war literature from World War One to the present. And so I've spent a lot of time this year um, looking at World War One, And um, it reminded me partially of um, what happened after World War One in Germany with the Fry Corps, where you had these like ex-soldiers who felt betrayed and, and found these sort of like military, com military compensatory organizations. But the other thing I um, have seen in my 
research. Um, I, in particular, I read a book by Keith Gandalf um, in which he talks about World War I as this sort of turning point in which um, military advancement became much more meritocratic. And so people who were not white often, even though it was very difficult and there were all sorts of obstacles put in their way, you could have troops that were um, considered to be more ethnic um, that were able to advance in ways that they hadn't previously. And it caused huge amounts of resentment. Um, if you go back and read something like, he talks about like Great Gatsby and how mad everyone is at at Gatsby, right, Gats, um, that he was able to advance because he would have been Germanic, German American. Um, and so there's this long history of, um, of, you know, people who have subsumed their identities um, because once you're in the military, right, everything is collective. And when you get out, that shared sense of purpose, that shared sense of brotherhood just dissolves. And it does not necessarily surprise me, surprise me both looking at the history, the literature, um, as well as what we're experiencing now, that people are finding other ways to, um, to connect. Um, this is why I like Sarah Ahmed's work on effective economy. She actually talks about the ways in which our emotions are these sort of cultural practices that bind us. Um, and she writes particularly about white supremacy. And I think there's a quote, something like, something like, together we hate, and this hate is what unites us or brings us together or something like that. She, um, but she talks about the sense that like, when you don't, that there are people for whom if they don't have other ways to group themselves, they will group around their hatred. Um, and especially in the military where we have practices like um, Karl Marl Lantes, I think calls it pseudo-speciation. Um, and Susan talked about it too, right? We, it's, you can't empathize with the, with the enemy because if you do, it's very hard to go kill them. Um, and so these sort of like racialized pseudo speciation practices, right? Some people come home and they're able to demobilize and step away from that. And some people don't, and they've you know, now found new ways to sort of collectivize that are, are incredibly disturbing. I have two more questions um, in the chat right now. And I, I think what I'm gonna do is um, you can take a look at them, I'll read them and I'll just read both of them. And then um, so that looking at the time that we have, uh, so the first question is from Miriam Wallace. I'm wondering about the varieties of ways of theorizing trauma we've heard about today from realist trauma and maybe its limitations, Leslie, to intergenerational trauma, trauma developed out of Holocaust studies and models that are more global based to something more like slow violence. Is there crosstalk among literary scholars, writers, therapists, question mark. This seems so special also loving that Wolf is running through several speakers. So that's the um, to response to that question possibly. And then the next question um, from Dina, I'm wondering if any of the panelists have worked with non-citizen veterans who risked their lives for a country which refused to embrace them as one of its own. So those are two um, possible avenues for our panelists to respond. Well, um, I'll say a, a couple of things. And then I had also noticed just briefly, somebody asked about the difference between moral injury and PTSD, I think, in the, I think that's an important, um, and that's a question about trauma, because there are two designations for um, forms of trauma. So um, there's a lot of trauma talk among scholars, at least, about, you know, sort of, scholars move between literary studies and feminist studies and studies of various survivors of various violent experiences and traumatic experiences but um, I'm not sure I have an answer but I do know that at least in working with um, veterans there is a societal component because veterans service members are, have split identities when they serve. They are, they are embodied human beings, people, individuals, but they're, they're operating in the name of a culture. So that their trauma, it's, I, I, I believe, um, and this is where Helene and I were, you know, sort of, that's where sort of the crux of that tension was in our, in our work or in our thinking, the tension we thought through that because the trauma is the trauma of acts committed in the name of the country the working through or at least the managing the be learning how to live beside that experience requires a public element 
because the trauma is the trauma of society at war that's now displaced onto veterans who are left to work through it on their own. And it's a way of, you know, the, the, the country not working through its trauma of being at war. So that's one thing that I think is important. Post-traumatic stress disorder and moral injury kind of reflect um, uh, an interesting shift. Post-traumatic stress disorder is defined as uh, a, the result of having been rendered passive in an overwhelming whelming experience of you know, excessive influx of stimuli, you are rendered passive. You are, um, moral injury is a, an injury of activity. When you are the agent of violence, when your injury is the, you, the way it's articulated, you believe you have done something that is, um, that goes against your beliefs, but it's an, it's, it is, um, an injury of perpetration and my feeling about that is that it is a way to um, personalize and privatize uh, societal injuries by making the warrior responsible the warrior has the guilty conscience it's not that there it's it's a designation designation that reflects the way we are leaving the work of coming to terms with the violence of war to those who have fought them. So it's the warrior who now is the perpetrator. Um, so, but that is a big difference. The PTSD is something, it's, it's, a, it's when one has been rendered passive, whereas moral injury is when one is, it's an injury of perpetration. Um, yeah. Um, but I just want to add, like, I know someone right now is doing a research with uh, drone operators who have um, basically, they are actually not, they're just telling people how to shoot and drop bombs as opposed to dropping the bombs. And that's an example of moral injury because those people then suffer PTSD without actually having um, executed the crime. And so and one of the things is the kind of like, basically their, their code of moral ethics has been broken even though they didn't commit that crime, which I think is a little bit more, and I just want to kind of like extend that definition. So I think in some ways that um, that uh, kind of opens up a little bit more of it being less of the problem, you're right, it's a problem of society, but it's also this sort of space where even though you didn't enact the 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 murder, you were the person who made that happen and you it, it kind of counters your sense of moral integrity, which it's is separate from PTSD where you were connected to it. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, that's no, no, that's my... right. But it's the same alignment because mm -hmm. the, the operator, and, and by the way, drone operators have a very intimate relation to their targets often. Drone operators have to track their targets for days often. They get to know their targets. They have to have a second, it's called a second, I think it's a second pass. They have to go back to the um, site of the strike to survey the, the secondary damage to see what other people come in afterwards once there's a strike because they too may be enemies. So there's lots of trauma associated with perpetration in drone warfare, but it's still there on the side of the perpetrator, even if it's mediated. So that's why it's, that is what moral injury is. And you can even experience moral injury if you don't directly commit an act, but if you are identified or even a witness to an act of perpetration. Which is so, what someone was defining in the, in yeah. the chat here. And they were probably, um, anyway, so I don't want to uh, um, monopolize. It's, yeah, it's the sense of betrayal. I think Tyler Boudreaux talks about, like he's he's like in Iraq and he's like at a family, you know, checking family's house and he and the man, like the Iraqi man comes up and gives him a hug. And in the moment he's like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then later he realizes like, that, that you can't give a hug freely when the other person has a gun in their hand and they're in your home, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, right. This is wrong. Like this moment that at the time he thought was this like meaningful connection was actually probably this man being terrified, right? And so that's the sort of sense of like, and that's, it has consequences for how it's treated, right? Because um, something that happens when you're afraid versus something happens when you're feeling guilty or ashamed are very different. Um, can I also say something up to Miriam's question? Because she asked about the theorizing trauma. Um, I, I think there is some of that, like, you know, Susan obviously uses, um, you know, psycho, psychological and psychoanalytic 
analytic theories. Um, Jonathan Shea, who's probably one of the best known writers about the Vietnam War, uses it, um, it writes about uh, Homer. But in terms of like veterans practices at actual universities, it's really weirdly siloed out, right? Like there's the people who write about war, like film and art and like, like representations of it. And then there's the people who do support services like GI Bill and the Veterans Resource Centers. And then that's kind of it. And so having people that are like, wait, how are veterans learning in the classroom, right? What kind of pedagogical technique, like that is an area that it's, it, there, there've been a few anthologies in the last few years that are starting to think about um, this intersection. So there is some crosstalk, but um, it oftentimes is that each group is sort of independent. And so you end up with veterans who might be at the university taking a class with a professor of war literature or you know a film class on war, but they don't actually know very much about how to teach veterans, right? And then they go to support services and support services don't actually know what's happening in a classroom. And so it, it's a problem that I think people are starting to pay attention to, but um, it, it, it absolutely has consequences for veterans, at least at the student level in terms of having their needs addressed as well as like their assets and what they bring to the classroom. I want to be attentive to time. Dee, did you want to say um, something quickly? Can you hear me? Okay. We can't hear you. You're muted. So, um, <laughs> No, I'm just humbled by the amount of knowledge in the room. I feel like, you know, that I could keep sucking it up all, all, all day. It's great. Thank I know, you. I know. It feels like these are so important. And I would just want to also acknowledge um, some of the other elements in the chat from um, Akua Amasupe, which is really, I love that you're here and seeing you after so many years um, about African-American veterans. So I hope you uh, attend to the comments in the chat. And I'm supposed to close no later than 2.25 and hand things off to Donna to wrap things up, but I just want to express for myself how incredibly grateful I have been to all the presenters and what a beautiful and moving experience it has been the last two days. Donna. Thank you. Um, I hardly know how to close, um, but I close with um, just gratitude for the power of everybody who contributed yesterday, this morning, this afternoon, I know that what I've been learning is going to resonate for a long time to come. And of course, our only serious collective regret is that Helene, who is here in many ways, is also not here. And that, that there is real mourning and real loss. And it is our obligation to transform that into the kind of community building and storytelling action that Helene was all about. And so I end writing for living with appealing for rewriting, retelling, not ending, right on. And now we're going to wink out gradually while seeing each other. And, and now it doesn't matter if people interrupt each other, you can unmute and be noisy, uh, whatever feels good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. This is amazing. Yeah. Really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy, that was thanks, everybody. Happy trails. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. So grateful to everyone. Yeah. Amazing. So wonderful. Thank you. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> More brilliance and creativity to us all. Yes. Ah. <sighs> Very lovely to see so many of you. Like Carla, you're right. There is something really amazing about watching these little boxes come and go. Uh, <laughs> it has a charm all the time. This con buddies. <laughs> yeah, Carla yeah. was. Carla I was. I love seeing you. Sending mm. you kisses. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you all. Thank Bye, you. Bye, Bye Susan. To see everybody. Oh. So nice to see you, Shirley, too. Yeah, really, so many. Beautiful. Really beautiful. Elaine's world was very multi generational. Mm -hmm. Yours, too. Yes, we have a we. <laughs> Yours, too. Thank, thank you, Donna and Jennifer and Carla. You, all three of you, did such a beautiful job facilitating and just holding everyone. So, thank you.
Help. Seth, I was so moved by your paper yesterday. Like so many people, I was crying and it was so beautifully written. I really would love a copy. I, I oh, just, I'll incredible. be happy to. Oh, I, that's very kind. Thank you, Jennifer. As as you all know, it's so weird doing these pre-recorded things because you're trying to share with a community, and but you feel on the other end sense of end of a camera. So, um, um, thank you. It's I really appreciate that. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll send it to you now. Thank you. And and uh, I take it you'd rather should I send you the written version? Yeah, the, send me the written yeah, version. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I should have said this when everyone was still here. Seth and Susan and Leslie put up with the uh, request, rather forceful, to pre-record. And I think we all really do know that that put an extra burden, but I think it was also amazingly effective. Yeah, and I think the combination worked really, really beautifully, Donna. Look, this whole thing just came together so, so beautifully. And I know, look, we're all so swamped. Academic life is so overwhelming. We're in the middle of a pandemic and it was really just so generous of all of you to keep this moving and do all that work a second Especially time. Gonna... Yeah. And uh, Jason and Olivia and Diana, who's been, uh, who have been here this entire yeah, time. Thank you. To um, yeah, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for your appreciation. So, so great. You did great work. Really good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was honestly so inspiring. I'm really glad to have joined you all. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, Carla. Sorry. Carla, everybody. Bye, bye, everybody. Yeah. Bye, I look forward to seeing you guys out. soon. And Donna, our art. So how's it going to work with the video? Is it going to live somewhere? It we'll is all live hear, somewhere, and Diana is going to tell us where at some point. And yeah, so cool. yeah, go ahead, Diana. Me. Can you hear Sorry? me? Oh, Can you go ahead. Um, so I will download the videos, and I'll upload them to our YouTube um, channel, and then I will share out the, the videos of today and yesterday, along with the reports of who attended. Um, and then I think that um, on Monday, I'll also schedule us um, for a, a small debrief, maybe like half an hour or so, just so we can kind of come together and like have a little bit of time to kind of talk through what worked, what didn't work, and that kind of thing, nice. if, that, if that works for all of you. Also, I wonder if the links could go out automatically to 